This is the One Piece Podcast, episode 378 for the week of Monday, July 27th, 2015. My name is Zach. And my name is Dude. Hey, Dude, how's it going? It's going great, Zach. How are you? I am also going great. Uh, so we were just at Otakon. Uh, did you have fun there? Uh, yeah, I did. It was uh, it was notoriously low key this year, but um, but you know, not every single one of us was there, so uh, so that might have contributed a bit to it. <laughs> um, I, I personally liked the fact that the convention was a little quieter and easier to walk through, but it was it was a lot of fun. I went to more panels than I ever have. I could say that. Um, but I guess yeah, it wasn't there wasn't anything remarkable this year at Otakon. It's fair to say. Yeah, uh, there's I don't know. It's not fair to say that there wasn't anything worth seeing. But the nice thing about Otakon is there's usually something for everyone. That's true, including uh, the screening we did of the One Piece podcast goes to Japan, which seems to have done well considering it was at uh, 9 a.m. Um, on a Sunday. On a Sunday, I should have yeah. said that part as well. Uh, thanks to everyone who came. It was it was awesome to see the attendance for that hour that we had. Um, and it, it always makes me kind of, it's hard for me to watch myself work from two years ago when I was delirious and acting terribly. But we really appreciate you guys uh, watching. If you missed the movie, you could go and see it for free at oppjapan.com. So on today's show, we have some cool stuff that we brought back from Otakon, including a, a very short interview with Christopher Sabat. I think this one runs under 10 minutes. They gave us a very sh small window. Uh, so we didn't have the uh, normal extent of Sabbath futzing around with our microphone and so on and so forth. Um, but we may also have a, a cool little addition, additional Sabbath on this uh, on this podcast. Uh, I don't know as of yet because I have to go through the and see if it sounds good. But keep listening and maybe you will hear that little surprise uh, toward the end of the show. Um, we also have Steven on to go through volume 78 with us. He was not at Otakon. We recorded this a little bit ago, uh, but we're happy to finally have Steven back on the show in some capacity. Uh, remember if you have the AAC feed for the podcast, you could see along, uh, you could see pictures along with what he's talking about when you hear uh, the little camera noise. We'll go through that again a little bit later. Um, and yeah, I think that's basically about what we have on the show today. It's a little bit of a short show because the anime is off this week and the manga is off this week. Uh, but don't worry, next week the manga will, will be back with chapter 795 and the anime will be back uh, with the remainder of the law uh, flashback at episode 703. And we'll be going through both of those with you next week, I'm sure with a packed house. Um, we also were... We also were lucky enough to really hang out a lot with the the good people at Crunchyroll this weekend. Uh, Miles, Tiffany, uh, and now Adam's working there, uh, so I want to give them a shout out and a thanks. Uh, you could check them, you could check out One Piece on Crunchyroll. The entire series is there in HD. Um, and also, of course, uh, I want to thank uh, Jose and Ed for putting up with us and for uh, hanging out with us. And uh, it's unfortunately they couldn't be on the for this little portion of the show tonight, but. They're good guys, right, dude? Yeah, they are. They are good guys. Um, I enjoyed uh, sleeping in the same room with them. <laughs> as always. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. I, I mean, not as always. Uh, I also want to just mention a couple other things. Uh, I want to apologize for uh, the delay in the One Piece read-through. We had some major technical issues so we're just going to do six volumes next week that's kind of the norm anyway uh we're going to do we're going to call it paramount war part one uh, i think or preamble was your other suggestion or something like that prelude uh, prelude yeah um but it's going to cover the sabote stuff the uh impel down and amazon lily stuff i said that out of order but you get it it'll be volumes 50 the very very end of 50 through the very end of 56 i think um so everything up through marineford uh, uh basically uh there's one more thing i want to mention if you have not checked out my crazy crazy long article the one piece connection please give it a read let your friends know about it uh, a lot of hard work went into that not just on my uh, behalf but also big thanks to uh brian uh Cy, uh, I'm going to forget people here, Kyle, James, Jammer, Steven, and Greg, and anyone else I'm forgetting to mention, um, and Ed, of course. Uh, 
it's a really, really crazy in-depth article. It's like 8,000 words or so. But I think from what the reaction is, I think people agree with me when I say it's worth the read. Um, dude, you had a chance to go through it. I don't want to sound egotistical. It's like, what do you think while I'm here? <laughs> I did. It was very concise, and I've been plugging the crap out of it since you wrote it. Um, it really takes all the theories that have been thrown around over the last couple of years and, uh, you know, thoughts that people might have had and kind of condenses them into one big essay. And uh, it's definitely worth reading if you're a fan. Uh, and it's also well written. Thank you. Um I appreciate that I, because, of course, I write better than I speak. Uh, but, oh, yes. According, <laughs> according to our, our <laughs> friends quote, at 4chan. Our quote-unquote friends. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, if you, should, you guys should check it out, though. It's, uh, it, it is more of a compilation of things, and, and I try and source you know, where they came from. A lot of them are kind of just lost to time. There's like it's it's impossible to figure out where they came from. A few of them are mine and a few of them are Brian's and and the groups. Um but there's also the the stuff with the half moon uh is something that Greg heard of long ago on Japanese forums. So it's it's interesting to see how well they kind of hold up. So uh please give that a read through. Um that's at uh, onepiecepodcast.com. I think with that all out of the way, why don't we start with our volume 78 recap with uh with Steven and then we'll get into some Udicon goodies. You ready? I am excited and ready. I get it. I say that. Yeah. You did. This is the volume recap for volume 78, and we have Stephen Paul, the translator for One Piece and Weekly Shonen Jump, with us to take us through this. Hey, Stephen. Yo. So tell us a little bit about volume 78. Uh, what's the title? I should have probably asked. Uh, yes, the, you forgot the title. Volume 78, Champion of Evil. Evil. <laughs> Better than um, being the Champion of Death. Mm, I suppose. Um, and yes, we, uh, I, I think we probably, do we touch on this in the, the podcast? I feel, it feels like we always talk briefly about the cover for like five minutes when it comes out yeah. in the podcast. Be- before we um, start, I should have said, if you are on the AAC feed, you will hear this noise. And that means a new picture is showing up for you to see and uh, follow along with what we're talking about. Stephen, now you could continue. Uh, yeah, so this is, of course, uh, it is the counterpart to the uh, the cover of Volume 77. Uh, that one featured Doflamingo and all of his goons. And uh, this one is all of the heroes. It's uh, Luffy. And all uh, their least, goons. Yeah, all their <laughs> goons. Um, the remaining Straw Hats that are still on Dressrosa, Law, and all of the um, the Gladiators and the Tentadas and so forth. I, I do like really how... like this cover, yeah. Mm-hmm. Steve. It's funny because some so many of you guys were hating on the previous cover. Maybe because this one just has more characters on it. Um, uh, more interesting poses. Yeah. I think the other one makes more sense now that we have this one. Right. So I, I don't hate the other one as much. Um, I also think Frankie kind of makes this cover for me. I'm going to be completely honest. <laughs> I like uh, Bartolomeo and Cavendish doing the uh, 90s sitcom rubbing of the shoulders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the, in my the size of the apartment. <laughs> is there any cheek, cheek dance? Is, yeah, is there anyone else dance. weird? I don't know if there's anyone major that got uh, left out of got this cover. Snubbed. Yeah. Well, Steve, can you name everyone who's here? Of course I can. There's uh, King Hippo. There's uh, Giant Robo. Uh, and there's... Flapper. <laughs> can you tell me which one flapper is no flapper's not on this cover i don't think no one likes flapper i thought he was the one in the hat uh they are right. all wearing hats shit for the most part i think uh, i think flapper is the guy with the red hair no flapper's the one with the red polka dot hat oh, i thought flapper was the one with the top look top i, I know these things one. because i've drawn flapper before <laughs> um <laughs> so so not drawn flapper? flapper yeah Wow. Yeah, so not everyone forgets about Flapper. Like a mural. I was paid lots of money to paint him on the ceiling <laughs> of a church. <laughs> Being an artist is great. Uh, no, uh, yeah, Flapper, is, <laughs> Flapper has been snubbed from this. I'm trying to think of any... Uh, well, I think these are all the Coliseum guys that had like a major... Uh, Fight. You know, 
yeah. fight or were involved with another character. Yeah, know, there's got... no there's no Don Chin job, but they do have Sai, so I guess he's yeah. kind of the stand. He, he represents, and no one likes Boo. No, I forgot about Boo. Gonna be completely honest here. Um, yeah. So what what's under the cover? Uh, under the cover is the usual illustration, and I actually I spent about a good. 30 or 40 seconds just staring at it, looking for Panda Man. Me too. Um, and it turned out that he is not on the front cover. He is actually on the spine of the volume. <laughs> and uh, it, it seems that um, uh, Crying Manchuri has been transformed into a, an adorable little um, pen, pen, pentata. Pen. Uh, yes, he uh, P- Panda Man is hiding in uh, in Manchuri's uh, face. Outfit. Yeah, <laughs> in her face. He's, he's hiding in her face. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of creepy, but uh, you know that's Panda Man for you, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's the body snatcher. Mm-hmm. So what's on the inside flap? What is our? This looks like oh. a very different Oda thing. There's very large text and mm-hmm. yeah, he's very forceful in this. Um, so yeah, we have the uh, the illustration of the guy wearing the like red jumpsuit with uh, some awesome uh, Pika shoulder pads with the spikes, and then he's got uh, wings on his the sides of his head, um, and he says. Uh, there is no law that states that your factory uniform can't be this. And he says, all you need is bravery and some funding. Um, so here begins the Brave Volume 78. So, uh, Steve, I think we have to get these outfits together for the entire podcast crew. Let's get on mm. that. <laughs> well, you, I, 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 you have to pay us first. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> Well, it's it's not work. It's more as, so an, as he said. So it needs obligation. As he said, it needs funding. Um, yeah, that's right. So we'll start our Indiegogo for that outfit for the entire podcast crew. Uh, you gotta have a budget. In the what future. a wonderful time to plug our Patreon. Right, <laughs> patreoncom slash one piece podcast. Uh, <laughs> you could help us get that outfit, which is clearly our number one priority. Oh yeah, um, is, that a, is that a pouch or a gun? I really hope that's a gun. I'd love to get be a shoot a gun. I think it's a coach. Mm, that's the bad <laughs> idea. Uh, okay, I guess uh, we should get into the volume, and it it starts with uh, the the fight between uh, Kiros and Diamante, right? Yes, this volume contains uh, chapters from chapters seven hundred and seventy six, which is the uh, heroes of, hero of the Colosseum, to seven eighty five, which is uh, on broken legs. Um, Which is when we think Luffy wins, but he doesn't. Right. It's (laughs) basically, it's from, it starts with the showdown between Kiros and Diamante. And then it goes, yeah, it goes through, uh, you know, the the birdcage is shrinking and... um, Zoro's fight. (laughs) Yeah, Luffy unveils a gear four and... It's actually a pretty, it's a pretty packed volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's normal size, but it's uh, it's good. We're getting up to the the climax of the uh, the arc here. It's actually not too far from where we are now in the story. Um, so yeah, let's just get right into the SBS. First SBS, we have a uh, a header image with uh, oh, some level scamps. We just read about them recently in uh, the One Piece read through the last few weeks. It's uh, Chimney and Gombe blowing bubbles. In the shape of S B and S. That's a, I, I like that one. That's a good, uh, like nice nice line work uh, there. Very clean. Mm-hmm. And our first question um, is a it refers to the uh, the little note that Corazon left in the flashback when he said, "I'm going off to heal Law's uh, disease or heal Law's sickness," and uh, the. The person who wrote in says, "Oh, Dachi, I was uh, I was cleaning up my room today, and I found uh, a little a little note that Corazon left uh, years ago. And man, it just made me think about about Corazon. Man, that that old Cora. Oh, what a great guy! Um, I wanted you to see it, so uh, I, I sent it here with you. And it just says, uh, "I'm starting the SBS." And then, <laughs> and then Oda's like, "Oh, Cora." 
Uh, I've been and, I've been reading through these SBS starts as as we've been reading through the read through, and mm-hmm. it's nice to see how creative they start getting this this later. Yeah. Well, you know, we're almost at eighty volumes. You have to. Uh, there's only <laughs> you have to keep finding new ways to uh, to work with the pattern. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, yeah. And uh, the next question is: uh, uh, when I when I chug an entire bottle of carbonated beverages, um, I get a stomach ache. What should I do? And Oda says, uh, "I think that you should not chug them," which seems like a pretty good answer. Insightful wisdom That's from solid, solid. That advice. answers so many questions about the world of One Piece. We've been dying. <laughs> <you know? laughs> And uh, and then we have a, a drawing here um, of uh, Panda Man's parents. Someone has uh, so, someone someone said I, I I want Panda Man to have parents, so I created them for him. Uh, please please make these official. And uh, we have uh, Panda Man's uh, Panda should we call him Panda Mom and Panda Dad? Um, and they're basically the same, except Panda Mom has uh, little eyelashes drawn. Um, but they're basically dressed exactly the same as Panda Man. And Oda says, uh, it's really bothering me that his mom has a clearly a male body here. I was going to say. <laughs> uh, but thank you for the letter. And they are rejected. <laughs> he usually so, accepts things yeah, like this. So no. it says something. So long, Panda parents. Yeah. <laughs> we we loved you for the second we knew you. They've, they've been aborted. Um, <laughs> usually it happens the other way around, but okay. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> now I'm just thinking of the Mr. Show sketch. Uh, it's like, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Odenkirk. You cannot abort your son. He is five years old. <laughs> Uh, so the next SBS, um, another, I, I like this one too. It is, I uh, love yeah. this header. <laughs> it's great. It's a uh, Bellamy, um, just basically bouncing off a couple buildings and uh, creative, uh, recreation of the, uh, the SBS where it's like his, his springs and then the building and then the trajectory that he takes really really cool yeah, and then cool he guy. even he even has like at the bottom uh they always say sbs and then there's shitsumon corner which means like the uh the question, question corner yeah and he had the kanji for for mon in there is the door with like a little squiggly face like ow <laughs> you hit me mm-hmm. that's great and uh the first question here is uh, it's actually something that we had talked about very recently um in like a piece together i think um where it says uh i have a question it seems like most many of the characters in one piece um either are of unknown they, their mothers are unknown or are already dead um why is that and Oda's answer is very simple he says uh the antonym of adventure is mother that's why please don't write this on your test he says <laughs> um um yeah so i think that's kind of what we what we mentioned at least as far as parents in general but it seems like the mother the motherhood thing is is especially uh prevalent is that you know if you have a if you have a a steady home life you don't go out and be pirates and go on adventures and stuff i think in real life that happens with 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 neglectful fathers more than neglectful mothers maybe maybe both i don't know that's just from what i hear in culture and stuff anyway Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the next question is uh, some some background stuff, which is uh, things that I talked about um, when this came up on uh, in the uh, the Dressrosa arc. But um, obviously, it was not made explicit in the text. It is about Gimlet. Um, he says yes in chapter seven fifty five. Gimlet, who is uh, Senor Pink's son, um, that is a cocktail, isn't it? Um, is it possible that Oda Sensei, you are a fan of Raymond Chandler, of course, the uh, the mystery noir writer, um, or do you just like alcohol? And uh, Oda says, yes, that's where I got the name Gimlet. Um, he's, he says it's kind of tricky to explain this, um, but it is um, it's it's a little bit. Uh, he he's kind of playing off of a. Um, uh, of a line from uh, Chandler's novel, The Long Goodbye, which is a um, real famous um, noir novel. It was made into a movie in the 70s by Robert Altman. Um, it's a hard-boiled 
novel. And there's a line. I'm not sure if this is actually the line. I think from what I could tell, the line in the story, at least the one that everyone seems to quote, is that a real gimlet is gin and lime juice and nothing else. Um, but here he he says the the line is, um, you're you're a little too young for a gimlet. Um, it's the famous line. Um, so I guess <laughs> maybe that's why he called his his infant son. <laughs> You're a little too young for a Gimlet. Do you warm him uh, a bottle of milk? No, what he ne- what Gimlet needs is a good old fashioned Gimlet. <laughs> you need some. All he needs gin. is gin, gin and lime juice and nothing else. <laughs> That's how they used to quiet babies, Dan. So yeah. it's possible. Um, so don't do that. It, don't, don't do that, no, folks at home. No, please do not do that. <laughs> um, he says. Uh, so yeah, if I was going to make this a hard boiled story, I figured that was a name I had to slip in there somewhere. Um, so if you're curious, you know, look, look more into it. And uh, Russian is the uh, another name of a, a type of drink. And he also points out that uh, although he is from Kyushu, um, which has its own famous type of, of liquor, I think Kyushu is uh, Mori. I think so. Um, or maybe that's not uh, having that now. That, that might be um, um, Okinawa. I think Kyushu is Shochu. Um, at any rate. Uh, he's from he's from Kyushu. Uh, he writes a pirate story, and he loves hard boiled things, but he can't hold his alcohol. So, I could kind that. of I could believe that. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know what basis I have, but it just sounds right. <laughs> yeah, and uh, then we have uh, oh, it's another one of these questions. Um, I can tell by the picture. Is, <laughs> yes, you can tell already. Uh, this one is supposedly from two uh, ten year olds. And it says, I noticed that Robin has big boobs. Later on, I noticed Nami also has big boobs. Why do they have big boobs? Is that what you like, Oda-san? And uh, Oda says, I've, I've said this time and time again. I draw the dreams of all boys. So, people of the world, get big boobs. I'm on it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm already there. So you're saving up. <laughs> That's exactly. I, I want to make a note that I find it ridiculous that the picture they used of Robin is her declaring that Shirohoshi is the Poseidon. <laughs> like the most, one of the more could, important. It could, it could yeah. have been the I want to live panel. <laughs> oh my God. I I've wanna... noticed that Robin's gone through a lot of characterization, but she's got some great boobs. <laughs> You know, that's probably one of the better explanations for the big boobs. <laughs> the dreams of yeah. maybe not 10 year olds, but 11 or 12. Would, I wonder if it will get flack for that statement. I'm pretty sure it's tongue in cheek. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think so. It's, it's half tongue in cheek. From, yeah. you know, from all the SBSs I've been reading, it's just clear that Oda, Oda is a giant self proclaimed pervert. Mm-hmm. And he's proud of it. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. Usually. <laughs> Go ahead. So the next chapter, let's see, next one we don't have an SBS because that is the pizza party color spread. Oh, I love that one. We had a lot of fun talking about that one. Everyone gets their own pizza. Yeah, half of them are eating it crust first. <sighs> Backwards what country. Idiots. It, yeah. What idiots. What do they put a uh, freaking uh, cocktail franks uh, as the crust? <laughs> is that what they do? But they hold it by the cheese. Is this Pizza Hut or something? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the, the, the next SBS, uh, this is kind of a cute one. It's, uh, Leo and Manchuri. They're kind of doing it. Leo's doing his, um, his power, his sewing powers to sew a little quilt with a bunch of hearts on it. And yeah, remember when that came in handy in the story? Oh yeah. That was a, <laughs> that was a big thing. You know, when it came in handy, when they had to inspect, panel. <laughs> when they had to inspect region V, um, Ooh. or B. Uh, I do uh, want to mention. Not touch upon that. No, we're not literally sorry, no. and figuratively. Sorry, sorry. I just got a, like a quick sudden burst of anger, and I'm like, oh yeah. How come nothing ever came of that? Um, the first little panel in this picture is actually the first picture we've ever recapped, and it was Sanji, you know, uh, is that right? prancing. Yeah, as a as a cross dresser in. Oh, uh, man. In Only 250 chapters ago. Yep. <laughs> yep. So this is an interesting question. It's kind of a nonsense one. Um, this this person writes in and says, oh, hello. How are you? I'm fine. Um, I have a big question about um, One Piece, my favorite topic. Um, and 
in, in order to to make this joke work, I, I should point out that in in Japanese One Piece before the the comic came around, One Piece referred to a One Piece dress. Um, so the the letter continues. Um, I just can't decide whether or not to go with a flower pattern or just plain. I mean, I love flowers, um, but it it seems like maybe I could, you know, kind of have a more grown up air if it's just a plain dress without a pattern on it. Um, what do you think I should do, Oda-san? And he's like, hmm, yes. Well, in my case, I often go out with a, uh, a flowery one piece with uh, lots of frills on it. Um, it seems like oftentimes when I pass by the uh, the police station, I often get questioned by uh, some nice officers. I'm not sure why, but uh, yeah, no, I'm fine. I love one piece dresses. Um, so there you go. It's a pun. It's all about the title. Yes. The next question is actually a, a good one, um, which I believe we I think we did catch this when it happened in the uh in the manga in Corazon's flashback long Corazon's flashback um you know there's the scene before Law and Korra bond um Law tries to stab Corazon because you know he was um he he was basically abusing the kid and it happens while Corazon is reading the paper and if you look real closely on the front uh, on the front cover of the paper, it looks like there is a drawing of Crocodile um, in an article there. And uh, so the question is, uh, what uh, what kind of article was this about Crocodile? And uh, Oda says, yes, that's uh, well spotted. That is, cor- that is Crocodile. Um, this is from 16 years ago when Law was 10 and Doflamingo was 25. Um Now, this happened when Crocodile was about 30. And when he was younger, um, he much like Luffy and uh, and the Straw Hats, you know, he he just kind of raced through the seas and his name spread um, far and wide very quickly. And he ended up getting added to the Seven Warlords in his early 20s. Um, So he was quite a quick up and comer. Um, and after that, he, uh, he basically waged war on Whitebeard and got just annihilated. Um, so he did, he did kind of calm down. He, got, he went on the down low for a little bit after that. Um, but his ambitions were kind of building up in the meantime and were eventually turned upon the kingdom of Alabasta, as we know. Absolute That's the story. Yeah. yeah. That's, and, uh, oh, there's more. Yeah. No, I just finished. Um, so... Uh, this is uh, right around the time that as a seven warlord, he began hunting down other pirates, um, which kind of made him a bit of a hero. Um, and he got his his name in the, the papers now and then. So it's basically it is a, a an article about his heroic exploits. So it's a puff piece, pretty much. And that's it's... that's interesting. That's I think that's a little bit of new information that definitely he went. He went after Whitebeard once he became a warlord and that he mm-hmm. became a warlord in his 20s. So, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, we don't really get a sense of like sort of the 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 sort of official history of the seven warlords that we've met in the story. Like, you know, how long they were around or who might have been before them and stuff like that. So that is kind of an interesting sort of look at the historical record. It's also interesting how a lot of these big, a lot of the Seven Warlords, I mean Moria included, um, and Crocodile now, uh, were defeated by one of the four emperors, and that's kind of how they were like put in their place, essentially, you know, uh, and thrown back to the other side of the Grand Line in in, in a way, literally and figuratively. Um, mm-hmm. And it's interesting to see, you know, let's see how Luffy handles this uh, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's also pretty clear, I think, when you look at the kind of the the infamy and the the general prestige of the four emperors versus the seven warlords, you can kind of see that it's like the seven warlords are like the government's attempt to kind of counteract the four emperors, but it's like they're they're just sort of they're trying to throw money at this problem pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um but it doesn't really work because, you know, they're not really a match for the four emperors. Like that's why those guys are the, the biggest pirates in the world. Um, which is 
is kind of a neat thing to to notice when you see it kind of played out um, over the course of the story. So that is that for that SBS section. The next one is what the fuck is that? I don't even know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it's a skull. So, but it doesn't look like Brooke. It's maybe, like there's. A I think part. it is Brooke because he has a, he has a scar, but he's got no afro. Did his afro become the letters backward? <laughs> uh, it's. I suppose that's possible. I mean, it kind of looks more like a fart cloud to me, but um, leave him alone. It's just a I child. Yeah, you, I would hope you so. Tried. I don't know. There's no guarantee of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's an interesting one. Um, I like this this first question here, uh, clearly, about Pika and his shoulders. It asks, what are those spikes <laughs> on a, Pika's shoulders? Good question. And he says, uh, you know how if you if you take a young watermelon and you place it inside a rectangular box and then it continues to grow? Square it, watermelons. It, yeah, it turns into a square watermelon. Um, well, when... Pika put some, uh, you know, some shoulder, some shoulder guards on his shoulders while as he was growing, uh, they just happened to grow into that shape uh, underneath them. So that's, that's why, even creepier than the explanation yeah. I assumed it was. So yeah, it's not like a silicone implant or some kind of sort of body modification thing. It's literally just he he wore some spiky shoulder pads while he was a, a grown boy. What a weird ass guy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wonder if, you know, it, since he was, um, you know, sort of constricting his uh, his body with those um, with those shoulder pads, if that's sort of why his voice got all high pitched, because he was like, maybe he was wearing some um, some nut guards or something. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Uh, there's a question. Um, he's like, yeah. So this birdcage thing, couldn't Buggy just like go right through it? And Oda's like, uh, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, he pretty much could. Um, all of Buggy's friends would be stuck in the cage, but he would just uh, pop right out on his own using the chop chop fruit powers. And uh, the guy drew a drawing. I guess it's supposed to be him, like, turning his body into slices or something. Um, it's weird. Oda says he likes it. Um, so that's why it's there. And our next one is uh, another one that seems to be from a uh, from a kid that says, um, "I want Luffy to fight Doflamingo, and I want Luffy to win." And Oda says, "So do I. Let's root for him together." So, oh, so sweet. That's us. Wish him luck too. Good mm-hmm. luck, Luffy. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. And uh, then the last one here is uh, what is a, a easy way to draw Zoro? So it's one of those how to draw things. Um, and usually with these, um, you know, they always have like these sort of descriptive uh, steps so that you you kind of associate them with these images in your head. So um, first step, you, uh, you uh, a bunch of spiky grass grows. Um, so you got a patch of grass there. And then underneath it, um, a big sea, a big ocean, and uh, two, two. Uh, well, it's the it's the hiragana for hey, um, but it's basically like a what do you call it? like that a carrot mark, like the uh, you know shift six. I say I a, say seagulls. <laughs> seagulls, sure, sure. <laughs> um, That's what they look like to me. Step three: um, a little drop of soy sauce on a single gyoza. Or a pot sticker, as, as you may know it, <laughs> and uh, then um, and then cross the other one with a uh, or um, split the other one with a cross and eat up. And the next step, uh, three little swords for the three sword style. Looks like it's just three lines for his uh, his eye and or his eyebrow. Not his eyebrow. His uh, I guess just his his eye fold and then his nose and his mouth. And then the last one is uh, add some round things and some spiky things on the left and right. And you have Zoro, the little lost boy. Um, Also, he grew some hair. And Zoro is saying, who are you calling a little lost boy? (laughs) So there you go. That's how to draw a simple drawing of Zoro. 
What's that? Now you, now you can make your own manga. <laughs> <laughs> and then next, it's uh, that since, easy. since you didn't get enough of it, you have a, uh, a coloring corner of the pizza party. So you can... You can draw the pizza however you like. If only I could draw them eating it correctly. <laughs> oh, I'm so mad. I'm sorry. Mm. I'm I'm a big. Uh, I'm kind of pompous pizza about etiquette. my pizza. Yeah, I have. Pizza I have a, yeah. yeah. Um. Next one. This is. I think this is probably like the best SBS question of the bunch. Um. It is. Uh, well, first of all, we have the the header is um a great one of Corazon and Baby Five. And uh, it's Cora, you know, he, he got the uh, he, he got a cup of tea that was too hot. And so he's just spitting out a giant SBS pattern while while baby five uh, laughs maniacally about it. And uh, our first question here is about uh, Buffalo's unique hairstyle. This person wants to know if uh, he sets it himself every day. Does he sit in front of a mirror and uh, craft his um his hairstyle and Oda says, no, it's a cow lick. So there you go. Just does that automatically, naturally. And the next question is uh, kind of the big one. As I, as I said, uh, it is about Drake and his appearance in the flashback as, uh, as we noted um, at the time. Um, so in the flashback, we are introduced to the pirate uh, named Diaz barrels um, who has the, uh, the op op fruit and um, he has a um, a kid with him named uh, Dory or Dre, I think I, I spelled it. Um, and uh, is asking, is this the um, the captain of the Drake Pirates, Diaz Drake? And um, he noticed that there's the name Diaz. There's the X uh, scar on his chin, and uh, that that and he they're also from the North Blue. Um, and he says, does that mean that Barrels is Drake's father? And Oda says, yes, that is correct. Um, Diaz Drake is, of course, one of the, the young pirates uh, in the worst generation who are um, uh, they're pushing all the papers. They're making headlines um, all around the world, uh, along with Luffy and Law and the others. Um, his father, Barrels, was a former um, naval officer. And uh, Drake, as we can see in the, uh, you know, he pulled up all these different pictures here of, um, you know, him as an adult and him in the, the flashback. And then the uh, the drawing that Oda did in the SBS um, a while back of uh, the childhood of all of the um, the supernovas um, where he he looks like he, he looks up to the Marines. He wants to be a Marine. And he says he looked up to his father, who was a, um, a naval officer. And, uh, you know, he he dreamed of of being in the Marines himself. Um, but something happened and his dad became a pirate. He became abusive and he, he just turned into a, a real bad man. And uh, Drake stuck around um, because, you know, he still believed in the uh, the, the father that he remembered um, from the past. And in this flashback, he this was 13 years ago, 13 and a half years ago. He was 19. Um, which is a little old to be a boy, um, but he kind of, he, he, it seems like it's, this is his boyhood because he's kind of weak willed and subservient to his father. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but he says, uh, through this, this kind of, uh, fateful, uh, encounter with law, um, though they didn't, you know, of course they didn't realize it at the time, um, you know, Drake ends up escaping. He, he's outside of the, uh, the birdcage when it comes down on, um, uh, I think it was Minion Island. That was the one where they were, um, or was it Swallow? I forget. It's one of those three islands. And um, he ended up being taken in by the, uh, the the Marines, the Navy. And thus he began his own career um, in the Marines. But um, through some kind of twist of fate, just like his father, he ended up um, becoming a, an officer. I, th- I forget what the, the English term for this show. I think it's maybe a major... Or something I'd have to look up what the the so chart is. Captain, but I might be wrong. Yeah, I, I don't know. But anyways, he uh, he gets to uh, be, he becomes a an officer himself, and then he also left uh, the military. He left the, the navy and became a pirate on his own. So uh, what happened? What is he thinking? You know, what's going on? What's the deal? Uh, T.S. Drake was a rear admiral. Okay. Yeah. All right. There you go. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're. you're I, I, okay. I was just reading that for the right. read through. Yeah. Yeah, because then the next one would be Vice Admiral, and then 
I don't know. Um, yeah, so he was really high up, and uh, and he's like, yeah, it's that's strange, isn't it? And we also saw him in the uh, the cover story recently as well. That would be Caribou's um, when he uh, he appears and kind of royally fucks up their uh, <laughs> their like uh, mini you revolution know, ra- rally of the proletariat, or yeah, whatever, I don't know what you want to whatever call it. whatever he was doing, Captain uh, Gabaru or or whatever. Gabaru. Um, so yeah, Sorry. so he says. Um, yeah, so what's up? Uh, what's up with Diaz Drake? I guess we'll have to find out. So, yeah, it's a big tease. It's kind of it was nice to have that all put together because the the fact that there was that kind of synchronicity that they both kind of did the same thing almost that almost tripped me up when I was when we saw this in the um, in the flashback because I was like I thought Drake was the one who was a former admiral, but now it's like his father is like what's the deal there? And uh, it's nice to see that that. You know, there was an explanation that they they both just happened to to take the same the same life path for for some reason and and uh, presumably we'll find that out when um, when Drake enters the story kind of um, for real so that's exciting and uh, yeah and then our final SBS here um, starts with uh, she who who shall not be named um, Queen Orica Vacusuck oh well I just said that. Well, that's not her actual name, so we could say that. Okay, fine. <laughs> and uh, we get a uh, – actually, this doesn't start off with a, a question. It's a, it's just a statement from Oda, and he points out that uh, in the uh, in the last one, um, he, he mentioned – and, you know, of course, we went over this in our recap um, – that the author of My Hero Academia, um, Horikoshi, Kohei Horikoshi, um, you know, had once been in the Usopp Gallery Pirates himself. And so he he received word that um, another person who has, I said, I'm sure there's more than just these two, um, but another person who had uh, submitted and, and gotten into the Usopp Gallery Pirates is now a uh, professional uh, artist. And uh, I guess they just made, he just made his debut uh, with a one shot, um, but it wasn't in Jump, it wasn't in Shueisha, it was in a monthly afternoon. Um, which is a Kodansha magazine, kind of their famous uh, seinen, long-running magazine. There's a lot of good stuff that's been in there. Um, uh, oh My Goddess was like the longtime uh, sort of uh, seller seller of the magazine, but they had Blade of the Immortal was in there for a long time. Um, Genshi Ken came from there. Vinland Saga is in there. Um, I don't know. There's just a a bunch of stuff. It's, it's had a lot. I'm sure if you look on Wikipedia, um, so that's a pretty famous one. He just debuted. So congratulations to him. And he says, I hope you, you get a, uh, a serial story for yourself and, uh, then you can raise your, you know, raise a name for yourself in the sea. That is the world of manga. Um, good luck. And, uh, they, he is actually apparently in this this uh, volume's um, uh, Usopp Gallery Pirates as well, although it shows here that he's also in 45 and 74. And uh, our last question of the SBS for this volume uh, regards the, uh, the little reader request um, of Rika, who is uh, cooking at the, uh, the Marine base. Um, and uh, this question says, um, I saw on the TV recently um, that when uh, the actual Japanese Navy... Uh, is out at sea that, um, you know, because they're kind of trapped in, you know, this, in this place that's sort of cut off from society, they don't want to lose their sense of like the day of the week. And so every Friday they always have curry. Um, and that's, this is a famous thing. I've, I've seen that myself like on, on TV. Um, and it's supposed to be actually very good. It's, it's quite legendary for, for being an excellent, excellent curry. Um, and so he asks, does the, uh, does the Navy in one piece also eat curry? And does that mean that uh, Rika's curry is like super, super sweet? And and Oda says, yes, no, it is famous. Um, it's famous. The 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 naval curry is famous, and uh, it is. They also do that um, in the world of One Piece as well. Um, so it, you know, it serves a, as a um, as a chance to kind of augment the um, the nutrition of the sailors once a week. Um, so they, they, they throw in a lot of seafood. It's a special kind of seafood curry, um, he says. And um, there was a request at Rika's base for some of Rika's uh, sweet curry. Now, technically, um, 
this is this is a little kind of tricky bit of of wordplay because in Japan, um, like the the two ends of the curry scale is there's karakuchi, which means spicy, and then there's amakuchi, which it literally means sweet, but it basically just means mild. It's not. I don't think it's literally sweet, um, but you know because she obviously put sugar in the uh, in the rice balls, um, y- you would assume that um, like her hers is an especially quote unquote sweet curry, um, but it's apparently quite popular, and that is the end of the SBS uh, for this volume. Um, but there's actually some more stuff. Zach, did we actually talk about this on the uh, in the I, last I few weeks? I don't think so. Um, are you um, talking about the Usopp Gallery thing? Or yes. The... Uh, in the Usopp Gallery Pirates, you know, it's always they always have uh, several pages, although they don't, they don't put these in the Viz volumes. Um, you know, they usually – I think in the past, like just from re- doing the read-through, it looks like they, they did put uh, the U.S. submitted fan art. Um, yeah, way back, I think. Right, yeah, like back, back, kind of before, or maybe right around the time of the speed up. But then, since then, I don't think they've they've done that because, um, that I think that they got a lot of that for the uh, the Shonen Jump uh, print magazine. Yeah, which, I mean, it made course, more sense. Yeah, yeah d- doesn't doesn't happen anymore. Um, so the these things don't get included in the the English volumes, but there's always several pages of of fan art, um, from the Japanese readers. And it just so happens that uh, one of them, uh, which is credited to Rowena, that is the uh, the artist name of uh, Allison, our new uh, Japan news correspondent who uh, who took over for William recently. Not take take took over, but they uh, they work together. But oh, it, they do. Okay, all right. Uh, I mean, she t- took over his duties in Japan essentially because mm-hmm. he, he moved back right. to Belgium. He, right, right. Um, yeah, no, that it's super awesome. Um, yeah, it's congratulations. A, yeah. Dying. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a drawing of uh, Madame Charlie, um, looking pretty, uh, pretty stately, and I think I, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe we can get her to like uh, retweet her her tweet because if you go back, she did like a, a lot of people who get into the Usopp Gallery Pirates now. They, you know, they'll do these color illustrations and send them in, and of course they're printed in black and white. So then on on Twitter they'll reprint like, oh, here it is in the volume, and here's the original, so you can see the color. And, and, uh, so maybe we should see if she'll, um, yeah, it's on a uh, twitter.com slash Ruina. I think, uh, it's, it's somewhere yeah. in, in that archive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe if we, if we can do that, then we'll, I'll, I'll put, yeah, I'll put it in the description for the episode even. Yeah. There you go. The, the tweet. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah, awesome. that's, awesome that's, awesome that's really see, cool. See someone else we know, uh, get into the Usopp gallery. Yeah, and if if any listeners ever get into the Usopp Gallery, please tell us, and we'll mention it, and you know, tell people mm-hmm. to if they can pick it up and, and take a look. That's that's a it's a very big achievement. I know uh, CCC's done it before, right? I mean, we've had a few people listeners. Uh, oh, Alina even I think did. Yeah, and then um, a bunch of uh, some some of the people from uh, AP. I think it was Radon. Some of the people who are also Spanish, like f- Spanish speakers, they they sent in a giant thing f- to the SBS uh, one volume that um, had some questions about it, and, and he used that as kind of a oh here's here's a here's a an international uh, letter, and and so. They they got in and that that was really cool too. It's it's a big achievement. I mean, that's like one mm-hmm. of the that and getting an SBS question in are, are right. some of the two most direct ways to kind of reach Oda mm-hmm. uh, and the One Piece community. So that's that's a really cool thing. Uh, so congratulations to Allison on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, I mean, what did you think of this volume overall uh, with the content? Hmm. It, I mean, it was a little on the. The thinner side, I guess. I mean, you know, yeah. he always makes sure to put in one or two that are like kind of insightful or at least are um, kind of fleshing out something that he sort of hid in the story, like the crocodile that was uh, article and, yeah. and obviously the barrels thing and uh, the barrels and Drake. Um, but he didn't do like the uh, he, he didn't do the oh draw X group. As uh, yeah, blah, blah, I missed blah. those. Yeah. We're right. running out of X groups, I guess. <laughs> apparently, yeah. Or he just doesn't want to get too tied down to a pattern or something like that. I mean, that is tough because he has to kind of keep that. Uh, I mean, we saw with right. Law, I mean, that picture showed up again in the, in the flashback. Um, Dope Flamingo, even, you could kind of understand 
you know, now how that happened. Uh, maybe he doesn't want to reveal too much, but I like, they're like little teases. They don't really reveal anything. I, I don't think it's, it's yeah. always interesting. Yeah. Well, that, that, those would be the, uh, the childhood one. I mean, I, I think more recently he's just been doing like the weird, like gender swaps and I like those too. Goofy, goofy though, stuff like, yeah. Too. yeah. I, I mean, maybe he just was like, I, you know, I don't have anything particularly interesting on my mind this time. So I don't want to just draw something crappy for the sake of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Or maybe he was just too busy. He was like, I don't want to draw stuff. Um, so thank you, Stephen, for going through that with us. You could pick up uh, sure volume 78 on uh, – you said you got it on Amazon or was it Amazon.co.jp? It was, it was Amazon Japan. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I get mine because my new – my my store for new books um, went out of business. So now I'm just like, oh, well, whatever. I'll just order them from Japan. Well, there's one little thing at the end I do want to mention with this. And if you get it like uh, Kino Kunia, I think, uh, maybe one of the other Japanese bookstores either in the United States or Japan, you, uh, if you could qualify to get a free pin – uh, if you get one volume of a Shonen Jump uh, property, you get a, a free pin of, like, one of the secondary characters. Uh, I mean, I saw in there, there's Spandam. Um, just I, would, name... I would rock a Spandam pin. <laughs> I know you would. Uh, just, Remember basic... this guy? <laughs> name a character. Spandam, I noticed, because it was so weird to think of a Why pin. would they do that now? Exactly. <laughs> uh, Spandam. Uh, Brom. Uh, I don't know if they had a problem. Mister Four. Okay, okay. <laughs> I don't know if they had all Sorry. of them. Those are the characters you can get. <laughs> uh, but if you get three uh, volumes, you could get a big pin. And uh, pictured here is the Luffy one. There's also an Ace and a Sabo. They're pretty cool looking. Um, they're around the size, like double the size of a half dollar. So they're like, I can't think of like what is around that size. Um, but like a round Tostito chip. Um, this tells you a lot about myself. Uh, so, yeah, if, if you get that opportunity, Kino Kunia, I know, has it. I don't know where else they have that. So, you know, pick that up while supplies last. I think it's limited. Um, in Japan, I think it's limited as well. It's a campaign they're doing. Um, I think it's related to the 300 million. Oh, no, the Guinness Book Mark, it might be. Um, it, it's celebrating something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it always happens. Yeah. Uh, the last time they did it was with the postcards. Those were really cool with the Oda notes and everything. Um, mm -hmm. That was back a ways. I don't remember yeah. how long ago that was. Um, but, yeah, pick it up. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Steve, uh, for doing this, uh, coming on for this. Yeah, and um, we'll see We'll see you for the next volume thing in three or four months. Should be just about to the end of Dress Rosa. In yeah, the material, I be. think. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Pending. We're still not there yet in the, in the manga. So. Uh, fingers Fine. crossed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, everyone. I'm back with the dude here. Hey, dude. Hey, Zach. And uh, coming up next on the One Piece podcast, uh, we have an interview with Christopher Sabat. Uh, do you want to tell the people out there what, who, who Christopher Sabat is? Uh, yeah. You uh, you all listening might recognize Christopher Sabat's voice. Uh in many, 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 many Funimation projects, including Dragon Ball Z. Um, as the voice of everyone. As the voice of approximately everyone. <laughs> most notably, of course, Vegeta and Piccolo. Uh, and uh, in Full Alchemist as uh, Alex Louis Armstrong. And, of course, our very own One Piece as uh, Roro no Azuro. And, uh, yeah, we got the chance to sit down with him. This is, I think, the fourth or fifth time we've sat down with him just to put a little context behind this we started out the interview as a perfect transition from the previous segment giving him uh volume 78 and showing him just how much uh, ass zoro kicks there's no really real spoilers here so don't worry other than that zoro consistently kicks ass and then we talk a little bit about season seven so why don't we get right into it now where I'm kind of in this place where uh, I'm in this place where uh, I'm not doing much of anything man this no I know I was gonna say probably start. Should start. let's start our, our, our yeah, yeah. I'll start today. I'll skip yeah. through this whoa what is this <laughs> <laughs> yeah man so uh, yeah you haven't been doing too much and I guess this is like the Zoro arc though you're in it's just all Zoro all the time 
right? Uh, I mean, we we were. Um, it it was a little bit of Zorro, uh, and then it, f lately it's just been all as far as the dubbing schedule is concerned. It's been all Luffy. Like basically, I, he ended up somewhere weird, woke up somewhere strange, done some really a, a couple of odd things, and then it's just like he's been out. He's been down for the count for a while. So. Yeah. It actually got a little confusing because I think there must have been a moment where the uh, they were waiting for the manga to kind of catch up and uh, yeah, and there was just a bunch of weird episodes that, <laughs> that had these letterboxed kind of flashbacks and stuff. In yeah. Them and yeah, I was frankly a little confused as to what was going on. I think we still are confused as to what's going on. Yeah. So uh, you've had a lot of character development though before you kind of disappeared recently. Yeah, yeah, Zoro's becoming an incredible... I mean, he always yeah. has been such a great character to play, but I didn't expect the show to get so dark, man. It's, like, super, super dark. Um, and you actually might even have to... There, the times that I voice him lately have been so infrequent that I'm actually trying to remember exactly what even happened to him the You'll last time I saw him. You'll come back eventually. I'm trying to remember even where he was the last well, time I, I saw mean, him. Well, I mean, we had the stuff at the end of Ennius Lobby with Usopp, kind of you taking charge as the first mate. That was a big one. Right, right. Uh, the Thriller Bark stuff with Kuma. Oh, of course, yeah. I mean... That I was intense. From your commentary, I could tell. You were... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> 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 Those are the best commentaries, honestly. That's definitely the best. <laughs> Giraffes are awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, what, was the, what was it like doing that... Um, Sort of the in studio extra with the, the everyone eating during for the for the DVD. Were you, I wasn't you, part of that one. Uh, I no, was. he was the one with Ian Sinclair's face. Oh right, you you were you were there in spirit and on paper. Yes, yes. <laughs> they couldn't afford me. You know, I'm right. so expensive. So, <laughs> I don't know why I wasn't on that one, but yeah, I got to do. I, so I'm assuming you're referring to my commentary where I just ba we basically just dogged on Ian, Ian Sinclair the whole time. The whole time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was one of my favorite commentaries. I've hands down I've ever been. I'm waiting for you and Vale to you know do a real podcast you know? yeah okay. we've talked about that the, Put hours the unofficial shame. official Ian Sinclair podcast yes <laughs> I think that the needs unauthorized to official Ian Sinclair <laughs> podcast <laughs> we've talked about it uh, speaking of Thriller Bark uh, there's a there's a bit in there where uh, Zora gets a shadow stolen and you have to go double duty on characters oh yeah yeah where he gets to play uh, like kind of zombie yeah. Zoro yeah. sort of uh, yeah, we didn't. I, we didn't do anything too wacky for that guy, but it was really, it, it was really fun. I think the broadest change, of course, was Colleen's, yeah, like zombie version. But yeah. it was great to watch that too. Oh my god, it was so fun. Um, and there was a, if I'm not mistaken, there was a ridiculous, kind of a, what was the name of the, ep it was an episode we did that was just right in the, it might have been right after that that made no sense. Like it was just a bunch of. It was like a one or two off episode where it was the, we were all playing characters from a different time period. Um, oh, the boss Luffy, yeah, uh, like old timey Japan stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love those. Like you uh, get to play a, like a Buddhist monk or something. Exactly. Yeah. That was a, those were fun episodes. Yeah, they've they done like three or four of those now. I think. Yeah. They go back and. Back I feel and bad because I, I I always feel bad when I'm talking about the show because it's so confusing and it moves <laughs> so fast and Zoro's contribution is so light compared to. Uh, to Luffy's especially so he'll come in do something awesome and then I have no that's idea that's all he has to do though he comes in he does his awesome thing he, he goes to sleep, goes to sleep drink, yeah. beer, drinks, drinks beer drinks a lot um, but it's been really confusing some of my favorite stuff lately has been the stuff with Brooke yeah um, I love that addition to the cast like the addition where the episode where Brooke is like awkwardly trying to figure out kind of what his place on the ship is and he's just kind of joining in everyone's activities poorly and <laughs> and he sits in he sits in with uh Zoro like while he's meditating or something like that and he says he needs to pee and Zoro has to <laughs> carry him off it was really funny to uh, me. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's one of the better filler episodes they've done. How yeah. was doing the episode where you actually all disappear though? I mean that's that's a big moment. I am having a hard time remembering exactly so what episode that was. That would probably be the last was. thing you did, yeah. chronologically at least. Yeah. I'm trying to even remember... When Kuma finally gets, you know, knocks you away somewhere else. Yeah, I don't... I, like it, The show's so confusing <laughs> to me sometimes. Uh, I, I remember going through the ordeal. I remember Zoro going through his insane ordeal. But 
frankly, the last episode I recorded with them has been a blur because Funimation's gone into this uh, this new broadcast dub initiative where we're trying yeah. to record everything so incredibly fast that I'm now working on you know 15 shows simultaneously, and it's become really confusing to figure out what I'm doing on anything. And it seems like, and truthfully, the last Zora I recorded had to have been. Like mm-hmm. I, it's it's been all Colleen right now. It's yeah, it's all the, Luffy. We we discussed with her. It's the Colleen show now. It you know, is. It's, just, it's the Luffy show. Yeah. But you'll come back. You have lots of stuff to do. Like what you were looking at before. Yeah. Thank you for giving this to me permanently. Um, <laughs> no, it is. Yeah. yeah. No, this is awesome. I'm really excited uh, for everyone to get back together. Um, but I'm also like excited about the day when. I finally have a chance to watch through all these, which will probably be when I'm about 80. <laughs> and uh, If you don't watch it, you could read. It's much quicker. That's true. Yeah. I thought about that. I think Justin said he did, too. I'm, I'm, I've considered that. Trust me. It might be easier. Um, and what, whenever they introduce this dude... Wall? Yeah. That really confuses me because he looks way too much like... Uh, he just looks like Zorro with a different hat on sometimes. Stark, Basically. Stark face. Yeah. Uh, so concludes our shortest episode. <laughs> shortest <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you, Chris, for coming on again. We'll have you on soon. Yeah. Like yeah. I'll uh, I'll be around. Let's see. What am I doing in the next few months? I'm sure I'll catch up with you guys. Sometime yeah. Soon. We'll do it. In fact, I'm going to be like UmiCon later on, and uh, like Tampa Bay Comic Con. I don't know if that's anywhere near you guys. We'll but try. It. We'll follow you wherever. Or you just go. come to Dallas and visit us. Yeah. <laughs> we did that. Yeah. We'll do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Make it happen. We'll break yeah. in in the middle of the night when you least suspect it. Okay, done. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Seriously, you're more than welcome. So you're going to show me the part? I'm going to show you the see. part, sorry, before he cuts a giant stone. There he is there. Oh, wow. And Big then bomb. cuts it again. Of course. And then cuts it again and sure. again and again. And then kills the guy who's in the middle. Oh, or nice. The, 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 the juicy center? The juicy the, the center. cream filling? That's the cream filling. He has a falsetto voice, this guy, too. Oh, nice. Someone's going to have fun with that. Yeah. Like a, a in, giant, in like uh, 10 years. Like a giant soprano hot pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for talking with me, man. Thank you. Yeah, I hate you all. I, hate, I really hate, we you, hate you all. We hate you, too. Uh, we double, uh, double hate you. Double hate you. No, seriously. You're, you're awesome. So since the interview with Sabbath was so long, uh, dude, we figured that <laughs> we may as well record something extra that's right zach uh right after our interview we pretty much went right across the hallway uh to listen in on the press conference uh headed by christopher sabbat and sean schemmel to promote dragon ball z resurrection f and you might not be able to hear all the questions here but dude did ask one see if you could guess which one it is if you can't hear it uh and there are some really good questions here from uh press people from across the internet or wherever they may be from uh so it's a really it was a fun crazy interesting uh press conference as you would expect from sean schimmel and christopher sabbat uh who are crazy guys as we may know uh so i hope you guys enjoy i want to give a big thanks to todd dubois from toon zone uh you may know him as uh, gw otaku on twitter so please follow him uh, I want to thank him for giving us half the audio here. Our uh, microphone ran out halfway, uh, and I had to as, as you will uh, as you will hear Christopher Sabat mention. <laughs> yes, uh, several times, uh, and that's what that's what happens when I don't have double A batteries around. That's all I gotta say. Who knew that you still had to carry those? Anyway, why don't we get into the press conference? You ready, dude? I am very ready. Press Thank Secretary you. Vegeta. Okay, we're gonna stand. Oh. General Press Secretary. I think we're supposed to sit here because all of oh, these the electronic devices. I thought we had here. a podium so we could go. And yeah, Sean had a real plan for a, this. Hold we, on. We had a plan. Let's say, um, hi, I'm the General Press Secretary for Vegeta and Goku, and uh, I'll be taking questions for Mr. Vegeta. And uh, please try to limit them to the Middle East and the war going on. Like totally like a presidential press conference because we've never done a press conference before, so we're trying to make it as presidential as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, the General Press Secretary for Vegeta, Mr. Christopher Sabin. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> I'm the General Press Secretary for Goku. I'm Sean Schemmel. Hi. I'm going to sit down over here now.
I cannot answer that question on the grounds I may be incriminated. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we've never done a press conference, so this is very fun. So that's why we're, we're goofing around. I guess you guys are. Sean, would you care for a parfait? It's a tough room. Yes, I'd like a parfait. Thank you. <laughs> what the hell is this? OK. It's a, it's a parfait, so, dude. So since we've never done oh. a, a press conference before, we don't, you guys are from various journalistic uh, backgrounds backgrounds and yeah. organizations. From different parts of the world. I know many of you have traveled from the distant lands to I be here terrible. today. terrible. Why am I eating this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, don't. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, can we get a candy remover in yeah, here, candy please? Remover. Thank you. I want to continue. If we could just please keep this on topic, guys. Um, the topic would be. Uh, uh, no one's asked a question yet. Are so. we going to deploy Vegeta to the Middle East for the conflict there with ISIS? Yes. James, Teen Beat Magazine. What's your question? Yes. Are you a Teen Beat? <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. I'm going to let Chris answer that one first. <laughs> Who inspired me? Uh, I stumbled into voice acting. Uh, voice acting was nothing that I even knew was an option. When I was a kid, um, we didn't have the internet, so there, we were easily fooled by things. Like, I really didn't even think about the fact that, that cartoon characters had voice actors that made those sounds. To me, they were just... They just came with those voices on them. And I'm not sure everyone even does think about that. They just watch it and they accept it for what it is. Sure. Um, yes, so yes, boy, yes. if anything has surprised me, <laughs> anything has inspired me, yes. it's been the fact that I was lucky enough to be offered a job as the voice director for Dragon Ball very early on. And I've gotten to work with professionals like Sean and all the other great actors. Which, by the way, I was not with. when you worked with me first. He was not. <laughs> I, I great got to work with amazing amateurs like Sean. Hey, there you um, go. <laughs> but over the years, I have gotten a chance to work with some of the most amazing people. And uh, it's weird how being, I, I was talking to someone earlier, sometimes being a voice director and an actor can uh, be something that leads to you being very self-conscious about your own skill set. Because someone will go, hey, man, just jump in there and do a British accent. And I think, yeah, I could do that, but like, I could call up Ian Sinclair, and he's sure. better at that than I am. So, sure. And as being a producer, you want to be able to offer people the best possible options for things. So, um, yeah, over the years, it's been both inspiring and made my life difficult because I sometimes think I may not be good enough to do what I'm doing. I guess my, my answer to that was I kind of got into voice acting in a way unconsciously because if I knew there was a job for voice acting, I would have pursued that my whole life. But instead... I simply was turning down the volume on my TV and putting voices in black and white television constantly, constantly doing impressions, constantly listening to um, you know, some of my favorite uh, impersonators. And um, I was a professional classical musician in Dallas-Fort Worth, and my friends were always like having me do impersonations at parties. They would even put me in a corner and say, do an impersonation of Popeye, do an impersonation of Grover, do an impersonation of Kermit the Frog. And I'm like, and I would try to do it. And sometimes I got close, you know, but that was kind of a weird training ground. And then uh, there was an open casting call for Dragon Ball Z, and it was in the Dallas Observer. A friend of mine was like, you should audition for this. I'm like, I don't want to do it like, No, you should. Like, oh, okay. But then when I decided to do it, I didn't just half-ass it. I was like, well, if I'm going to audition, I'm going to treat it just like a classical music audition. I want to prepare as much as I can. I put together a fake resume. I put together as much demo tape as I could. You know, I got really psychologically prepared to do it. And then I auditioned for it, and I was really And then when I offered him the part as Goku, he goes, oh, Really? Man, I, I thought my audition for Captain Ginyu was actually a lot stronger. I go, yeah. I go, man, you're gonna like Goku. Yes, trust, exactly. Trust me, said. you're gonna like this character. Yeah, way said. better than the character that lasts eight episodes. Yeah, I said, all right, and you know, kind of bummed after that day. I was like, cause and he kept going, like, are you sure, man? Yeah, I, I really did. liked my audition. I'm like, dude, be quiet. This is good. Which is, is so funny you. because that's so Goku-y, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, really? You sure about that? Like, it was so like <laughs> stupid. And then when I went to work and realized after two weeks of recording Goku that I, I had gotten the lead part of the show, I was like, oh, this is cool. I think the reason I felt that way is I prided myself on being able to radically change my voice. And Goku is not a huge departure from my natural voice, whereas King Kai is. And when you came into the show in the late, in the late 60s, it late sounds 60s. like you're talking about the year, uh, but in the late 60 episode numbers... Um, Goku wasn't necessarily the lead in the show at True. the time because it was in that moment where Goku's gone and they were yeah. trying to fight off the Ginyu force. And I didn't know. I thought and so you just show up and like 
kick Raccoon's butt. Yeah. yeah, and it was just so that's I was, and the reason I say unconsciously is because once I, once I got in the the booth, I remember thinking, wow, this really feels like home. So I feel like I had a dream to be a voice actor that I didn't know I had until I got in the booth, which tends to be a theme for me. Like I got to work with Frank Welker on Scooby Doo for a Scooby Doo thing recently. And I did not have a dream to work with Frank Welker, but I remember when I got to the session and he showed up and I realized who he was and I started bawling in front of a co-star who I didn't know. Because I just apologized to uh, Jason Spizak. I said, uh, I don't know you, uh, but I'm gonna cry now. And I didn't realize until after the session that I, I had a dream to, to be you know, with that kind of actor professionally. And, uh, uh, and then I cried after the fact. So I, I, I think I tend to, some people actually have clear, these are my dreams, this is what I'm gonna do. And mine tend to float around in the unconscious until I stumble upon them. So that's a good question, and uh, thank you. Uh, I'm guy, sorry, no more questions. Uh, yeah, I'm but can we at least stick, keep it to the ISIS conflict and how Goku <laughs> Vegeta will defeat ISIS? No, go ahead in the back. So Oh, Mel Blanc, Frank Welker, who else? Oh, Unless you want to replace those two with people. <laughs> I don't know. I, like my, let's see. Oh man, uh, it'd be hard to narrow them down to four people. Uh, uh, Don Castellaneta, be... maybe, or. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, if Hank Azaria. Yeah. Oh, oh, um, the guy. Uh, 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 he's insane. He just got back on the Simpsons. Brie. Harry Shearer is yeah. insane. Yeah. Those guys, I mean, that would be a, cl if, if we, if we had like 30 minutes to actually go through and analyze each one, it might, those numbers, those names might change, but that would be a good starting point. For uh, Billy West is Billy amazing. Billy West is incredible. Um, um, trying to, what's that? Scott McNeil. Scott McNeil, he's great. Yeah. Scott McNeil's amazing. Uh, uh, great guy also. Um, uh, Todd Haberkorn. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys. No. Um, you could put his face on there because it'd be a lot smaller and you could fit more people on there. True. So. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, or are you asking him something? You look, yeah, it looked like you were looking somewhere sorry, else to ask a question. <clears throat> are you, sorry, I interrupted you. As far as directing, how do you get other people to feed into characters? How do we get that? Well, first of all, I mean, Chris has directed a lot more. I was only an ADR director for three years, but I did have struggles because I was a new director, and I, after about a year of directing, I kind of, Figured out some things that Chris probably knew all along. I think, I think being very uh, to get people into character. I think actors tend to be generally very insecure, so making them feel really comfortable about their choices and, and trusting them is very important. Um, if they're having trouble getting into character, depends on depending on the character. I try to use a lot of imagery or anecdotes that would uh, that they would relate to. If I because we tend to know them personally a little bit. If it's a new actor or actress. Um, Fun, ask them questions to see what they're not getting. Um, Chris, can you help me out here? I mean, that's kind of I mean, where if you I go. If you cast a show well, you don't actually have True. to spend that much time getting people in the character because you have already chosen people who are very good at doing that. Um, but one thing you that can really hurt your session is if you are, as a director, if you act really passive about the uh, about what you're doing, if you don't at least try to make the job as exciting and fun as you as you can, uh, that can affect the energy of your actors. So, um, and I think if you're, if you enjoy directing, you kind of do this natively, but you, what I love to do is get into a scene with an actor and you're excited to kind of yeah. make that scene great together and you you let them do it, but you, but you kind of support them as they're doing it, giving them guidance as you go Especially along. Especially like if they get a take wrong, not saying that's wrong, but saying, that's really great. We're over here, like keeping everything positive. Sure, you know. And I think, in my in my opinion too, if an actor does something wrong, if it's not correct, it's because you haven't given. If they're a good actor, yeah, it's because you haven't given them that context. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, your character died, um, and that's why they're injured right now. So, uh, the, yeah, to me, it's it's really about just keeping the sessions fun and inspiring and casting good people. That's it. Hope that's helpful. Um, I, I, we should let you pick because I'm going to start picking forgetting people. who I picked. And... Hi, I'm in cosplay NYC Magazine. Uh, 
You're with who magazine? Cosplay NYC magazine. Oh, cool. Um, we're, we've been going around getting pictures of tons of the cosplayers around. How do you two feel when you see people like all the Dragon Ball Z cosplayers, the Yu Hakusho that are walking around? And have you ever thought of cosplaying? I've decided that if I just made a decision the other day, like well, my girlfriend cosplayed as Chi Chi once uh, when we first got together, and it was not for sexual reasons. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was Halloween. I just wore an orange Go Goku thing. Not for um, sexual. She's reasons. in the room, by the way. And uh, and uh, so I hope I didn't embarrass her, but I just remember make a joke. But I just decided recently that if I were gonna cosplay, I would totally cosplay as a Witcher because I'm so into that game right now. For sexual uh, reasons? Yes, for sex. Yeah, there's a lot of sex in that game, yeah. and it's hilarious sex, by okay. the way. Um, but yeah, I would cosplay as a witcher. That would be cool. I don't know what I would cosplay as, but I can guarantee you that it would be something very comfortable. <laughs> yes, because these cosplays... The yeah. ones I've seen that are just super elaborate or hot or whatever, like and not hot in a sexual way, I'm talking <laughs> about hot in a why are you wearing all latex kind of thing. Um, <laughs> those are the ones. Like So if, of all the characters I played, I'd probably do something like Alex Luis Armstrong because I wouldn't have to wear a shirt or something like that. <laughs> um, but it's, it's been funny over the years of doing this. I remember when I first started working on um, coming to these conventions in the late 90s, everyone that was dressed up, yeah, good luck. Um, sorry, can Sean have a couple minutes? This happened to, to me, by himself? the way, this exact same thing happened to me. We we're having dinner with the Toei Animation and Masako Nozawa, the voice of Goku in Japan. And, and I put too much soy sauce uh, in, in my dish, almost in that manner it spilled. And the president of Toya goes, you use too much soy sauce. <laughs> I went in broken English. And I was like, uh, cringing, sorry. But Moscow did compliment my ability to use chopsticks efficiently. So I was very, because I'm very good with chopsticks. She goes, you use good chopsticks. Yeah, she told me I was amazing. Um, <laughs> so she might have been lying. Um, actually, there, there was a moment during that dinner, actually, when, like, literally a single drop of soy sauce was dropped on Masako Nozawa's shoulder during the dinner. And I'm not sure how public knowledge this is supposed to be, but it, it's, it's okay. It wasn't anything offensive. But like the waitress came by, and this is probably one of the most important people in all of Japan, came by and like tipped the, got bumped and tipped the tray and a little bit of soy sauce got on her very complicated colored shirt. And um, you would you would have thought that they were going to have to shut that restaurant yeah, down and fly in a SWAT like, team. I'm so sorry. It's like people were waiting in line with rags going, oh, sorry. Yeah, the whole so, crew. They were very so, upset. So sorry. They had, uh, it was, it was a, a it was scary adorable. moment. Scary we, and adorable, yeah. but yeah. We, By the way, I just somebody was shot. I wasn't trying to be, but it started, it, the screen changed, and I was wondering uh, if whatever recording device you were using, oh, maybe the power shut off. I was afraid that whoever's recording with this, it had stopped, but I think it was just because your charger was done, and I just wanted to, I'm not trying to mess with your phones. You got a text from your mom. Yeah, it's it like, says, <laughs> call home. Uh, <laughs> but so. yeah, when, when I was first doing this, uh, cosplayers were fascinating to me and really, really weird. Like, yeah. it was very strange to me, but now... And there weren't a lot uh, of Gokus or Vegetas at the time. Not as many, uh, but now I, I recognize so many of them. And on top of that, I don't even notice them hardly anymore because they're all become so good and we become so used to them that it's not even unusual to yeah. me anymore. Like when people aren't in cosplay, it's more unusual to me. It's true. I kind of feel the same way. Um, we see lots of Gokus now and they're getting better and better and better. And a lot of guys are like not just like, oh, I'm going to dress as Goku, but like I'm totally out of shape. Oh, I've been working out for six years. To yeah. And they're like huge and they look like Goku. Yeah, and they've and got, they the, just because they've of the, got the contacts in and everything. Uh, yeah, it's impressive. They go all the way. I think this, the woman earlier today was using her cleavage as pectoral muscle on the Super <laughs> Saiyan 4 Goku. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was kind of disconcerting. I'll tell you, as, as a somewhat overweight uh, voice actor, mm -hmm. uh, it's always strange to me when um, people come up to me and go, man, Dragon Ball Z inspired me to be a level eight black belt in karate. Yeah. I'm like, man, it hardly inspired, it inspired me to go to work, dude. Yeah. Like, like, yeah, I, got, I got inspired a few years ago to start karate, and I studied for a couple of years, and I only quit because I moved to L.A. and hadn't found a proper teacher yet. For but, sexual reasons. For sexual reasons. And I, uh, I, I, I had the weird experience of being in class, and, and my kiyas, you know, you have, you have to say kiyah, Chotokan karate, sounds so much like Goku because I can't help it. And there are a lot of fans in the class, and I remember doing a movie going, Kya! and then the person next to me is going, <laughs> <laughs> like they're so geeking out, and I'm like, I'm trying to work out here. So that was a fun experience. Uh, it's flattering, you know. Um, yes. We allowed to talk about Bob Freeman? Oh, yeah, we well, yeah, should. We're here to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, were you 
guys even sure that you were even going to be able to dub that movie on such short notice? And what was the best thing about working on it? Well, the first part's a Chris question because he's the producer and director of it. Well, we were just, I, I didn't think we had such a short notice. I was hoping that we wouldn't have to wait a year before we dubbed it like the first time. Because uh, we, it, with Battle of Gods, we had to wait almost a full year before we could even start dubbing that show. And it was driving us all insane. We weren't even sure what was going on with it. So when the next well, what one, was driving us insane is everyone asking us if we were going to dub yeah, it. That is true. Every day, all day. But with... Uh, <laughs> Which is sweet. The, uh, the, you know, Resurrection F, we got those materials very early. As soon as they were finished working on the movie, I think we got an early animatic of it before they even had finished it in Japan. So we had a chance to review the materials. We knew what sort of people were going to be in the film, what sort of people needed to be cast. But... Coolest thing about Dragon Ball Z is that bringing these guys in to do it, it's not like we have to sit around and discuss what the characters are all That's about. That's cool. You just bring everybody in. They already know what they're doing. It's like hiring the A-team to come in and just d get it all done for you. Uh, Chris frequently says, I love when a plan comes together. <laughs> and he chuckles. And I do smoke cigars a lot. And then you have to drug me to get on flights. Uh, yeah. I'm not getting on plane. You know, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be drugged. No, <laughs> get me to Terrence. Like, get me. You mentioned that before. You said getting Sean to Texas is like That's true. Tea. And it's not because I don't like to fly. Just for some reason, every time I have to do a session in Texas, I get sick in some way. I think it's because I just don't like Texas anymore or something. I don't know. If I'm just actually trying to think of how out of context that sounded to all these people who have never seen probably the even seen the A-team. Just like... Me doing didn't know what Mr. joke T you were sounds making. totally racist now. <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, that's how he talks. I beat a fool. You know, I worked on my... When I was a kid, I was working on my Mr. T impression all the time, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so for Resurrection F and for Dragon Ball Z before that, uh, Mr. Saba, you've been on both sides of the microphone as an actor and as a director. So how do you manage those very distinct positions from, like, who directs the director in those situations? Oh, I'm, I'm the worst director to myself because I make myself do a lot of takes because I get very paranoid. The only thing that really helps me out is that I have an engineer. His name is Raleigh, um, Raleigh Pickens, and he has been the main engineer at Funimation, sorry, at uh, Ocratron, my studio in Dallas, for a long time since I started the studio. And he has seen so many of the episodes, and he's, he's been sitting there while I've done so much Vegeta and Piccolo and Yamcha that he's a really good gauge for me to go, dude, was that okay? Um, they will go, yeah, it was fine, man. Or sometimes I'll be doing it again and again and again. I'll go, Chris, dude, it was, it was like fine eight takes ago. You don't need to do this. So, uh, yeah, I'm very harsh on myself, probably more so than I am on any of the other people. Yeah. Oh, and it's for me, I never, I had a rule when I was ADR directing that I would not cast myself on parts for that reason. However, every once in a while, I would just have extra ancillary parts that I just could not get cast, and I'd be up at the studio at 3 in the morning. And this is in the early days, we were, we were using QuickTime. I'd have a keyboard, one of the first wireless keyboards, and I'd turn the monitor on into the booth, and I'd sit there and record myself uh, for whatever part I had to fill in or whatever part I was going to do you know, until I was done. And I didn't have a director, and I was just like, okay. And sometimes Michael would come in. I worked at Michael Center Nicholas' studio. Um, and he would, you know, check things, but in general he was off doing his thing, so I was just a crapshoot and I just hope I got it right. Um, I'm pretty, you know, I'm part of myself as well, but usually out of the booth. Once I'm in the booth and I make a take and I'm clear on it, I'm, unless there's, I nitpick a little bit, but, you know, there was only like two lines at the end of recording Battle of Gods I wanted to fix. And Raleigh and I uh, went through and checked everything and there was one or two lines, and I'm glad we did because one was just clearly inflected wrong. And we fixed it, and so there's not a single thing I think I did in Battle of Gods that I'm unhappy with. I, I consider it my best work personally as Goku. Um, I'm very thrilled with it. And, and Resurrection F, I don't know if it's better, but it's definitely equal uh, in terms of my part in it, I think. And, uh, I, and, and Resurrection F is just <coughs> just a mind-blowing movie in terms of quality, because they just keep upping the ante. So I think fans are really going to love that movie. And when you watch them together, you see how they kind of fit really well. But it's really a, a double feature. Like if you, if they had double, I wish they would do that. In fact, that'd be cool if years from now you do like, you know, Battle of God's Resurrection F afternoon double feature or some kind of thing. That'd be it cool. Would, yeah, it's a, it's a really good film to watch back to back. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, One Piece podcast, guys, you have low battery on your Zoom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you guys feel seeing all the fan created content like floating around like, like the abridged like series and all, like, and this, not just the Kaufman, like the fan art and all the other, like, tributes to your characters. I, I think it's a huge honor to have people, like, like imitating what it is we do. Um, it's, 
especially the the art that I see people come up with um, is incredible. And it's so weird when people come up and do an impression of your voice. Yeah, that's uh, weird. Someone comes up like, hey, I can do an impression of your voice. I'm like, good, now if it's too good, you know I'm going to have to murder you, correct? Like, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fan love out there. Some of the for fans are so good. I've hired artists, uh, cause I, I hire artists to create artwork that I sell and then I pay the artist a fee, uh, limited edition prints and stuff like that. I will look for artists that I think draw Goku in a way that's different from Akira Toriyama because I don't want somebody to just copy it. So I like unique uh, art styles and, and some of the tattoos in particular are kind of amazing. I see murals of incredible, like, looks like it was drawn by Akira Toriyama and colored, beautiful tattoos, you know, that make, make me want to get one, but I'm afraid. So. What was the name of the, the, the animator who created that piece that they were playing on loop at the Dragon Ball party? Oh yeah, that, was, I, just really, that was really funny. Yeah, it was really really long. Justin, movie. you know what that is? The the guy the, the Dragon Ball party. There was a wacky parody it of was Dragon Ball Z and Goku powering up constantly forever, and, like, and it was hilarious. Awkward, and he's gonna look that up. Um, awkward cutaways to things. Yeah, that was really <clears throat> really very funny. Uh, he'll find out in a second. I think it looks beautiful, and I think what I think what you're going to find is that with uh, Toriyama's influence, I think it's going to be fairly lighthearted and nostalgic because he really does love. You know, he started with Dragon Ball, so he's yeah. kind of a comedy guy. Like he loves that comedy, and I know some people have strong opinions of what they want Dragon Ball Z to be, um, and in that case, some people didn't like Battle of Gods because they didn't think there was enough like punching people in the face. And there was no like clear destruction of an enemy. Yeah, know? but I think that's what I love about his style. I, I like the fact that he already, in some of the episodes that we've seen coming out of Japan for Super, there's, they're, they're really family situations. It's yeah. Like putting Vegeta in a really funny situation with the bingo song or <laughs> um, <laughs> just, those are things that are, that are hysterical to me, and I think those are really, really charming. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if Dragon Ball Super might be more Dragon Ball like than Dragon Ball Z like, you know, because Dragon Ball is so comedy driven and, and story driven. And I still have a hard time believing that eventually it won't get to a point where there's people, everybody's a really yeah. long time. Yeah, Goku starts out as a radish farmer, I think. And, so, and by the way, this is just information that's on the web. We don't have materials, we haven't started recording, so I don't want to construe that. So this is just stuff that I've seen on the web from various fans posting <laughs> on my page and stuff. Um, I was talking to my producer Justin. I thought, you know, I had a different idea about what, how I wanted Dragon Ball Super or Dragon Ball Z to go, just from my own experience of the character. My original idea was that Goku would be like old, and everybody has to seek him out, like he's the new Master Roshi kind of thing. <laughs> then I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if Goku's character doesn't really like Vegeta goes through an incredible growth arc, you know, and Piccolo does as well, and a lot of the characters grow and change, and that's the whole what makes a story interesting. Goku doesn't do a lot of growing and changing personally or emotionally. He's just like, I'm Goku, and I'm the same. And guess what, now I'm stronger than I'm the same. You know, he doesn't really grow or change. So I thought it'd be interesting, since Goku got bonked on the head and lost all his Saiyan evilness, that if through magic or through some other means they restore it, and Goku becomes like yeah. hardcore, hard, more hardcore Vegeta. Like and he turns in balls, and yeah. he becomes even, like, becomes super mean. He becomes mean like Vegeta, that. and then he has to learn to be good, and then Vegeta's like, what, why, wait, I'm the bad man. You know, that would be an interesting, like, bad <laughs> like, Superman one. Goku or something. Yeah, like something that would be a really interesting story. I don't know if they'll do that. And this is, by the way, is my own personal speculation. I have actually had the same exact thought. Like, what if there was an evil form of Goku? Yeah. And then Vegeta had to actually finally be really, truly the good guy. Yeah, that would be a really interesting twist. And then, I mean, I don't know. Akira Toriyama is so predictably unpredictable. Like, you know it's Akira Toriyama when you see it, but it's because it's so predictable in that way. But it's unpredictable that he's so clever that that it's a twist or a new idea or something you didn't think of or why does this make sense or... I'd like to see him bring Launch back. Yeah, Launch would be cool. <laughs> launch would be very cool. It's a character um, he just forgot about. Yeah, he, apparently he did. He said in an interview. He, he forgot, forgot about, about the character. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll answer your question. Sure. Yeah, yeah uh, in regards to Battle of Gods uh, and, its, and its tonal change from how serious Dragon Ball Z was, 
Uh, you guys kind of got to showcase your comedy timing chops a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, do you guys have any comedic influences, like growing up? Oh, it's huge! I, I, you know, I know it's te you know it's all controversy right now, but I'm a huge Bill Cosby fan, huge Robin Williams fan, uh, huge Rich Little fan. Um, there's uh, George Carlin. And, uh, yeah, lots of comedic stuff. In fact, I used to do stand-up comedy uh, when, I, when I was a teenager, like late teen, like 18, 19 years old, and I left because it's an incredibly depressing scene. But um, surprisingly enough, but yeah, I mean, I've always excelled at comedy. I tend to, I tend to get comedic parts when I'm not doing Goku. When I was in New York, I got a lot of comedic roles, um, uh, and I really enjoyed. My favorite part of Battle of Gods is I had to carry, I had to do the whole Goku King Kai stuff because I was King Kai. Well, a lot of people realize that, and and I'm not trying to brag. I'm just like people don't. They go really like Cynthia Kranz who plays Chi Chi the other day just said, I didn't know you were King Kai this whole time, and I was like, yes. Because <laughs> um, I like to, I like to fool people. Because to me, that's part of the job. If you're thinking about me, then you're not thinking about the character. So if I'm making my voice different enough to where you lose yourself in the character, then I'm, I'm doing my job right. And Chris is a very funny person. is a hardcore prankster. Um, and I think the only part that was difficult about the Vegeta part comedy was the, how hard it was on your voice with the bingo song. But in general, that was very funny. Was way easier than I thought. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. When someone, when it was first. Uh, told to me that Vegeta has a song in Battle of Gods, I was terrified. I'm sorry, because if, you, if you've ever listened to the Japanese voice of Vegeta, his name is Ryo Horikawa, and his vo his version of Vegeta is like, and uh, Vegeta has a much higher voice than I have, and I thought if he sings, there's no way I'll be able to sing the same song. Oh yeah, because I'll be able to do a key too high. I don't know if you guys remember, but they, for Kai, they had a lot of the different actors sing the theme song, uh, and Sean sang one of them, and uh, somebody else sang some of them. I think Justin did, I think Rick you did. Even sang one Didn't of them. you do yours real funny? You do I did, I, mine's never been released did. because I, Mine's just, Didn't couldn't. you do like a country singer or something? Yeah, I couldn't take it seriously. Because <laughs> it just wasn't a song that I was capable of singing. It was just too high. A, it was too high of a song. It's a tenor. Had... I'm a lyric baritone, and that's at the top of my range. Oh man, yeah. yeah. It was. It was. I had to sing it like an octave lower. So just sang it. So I was having to sing it all down here. And it's such a funny. Yeah, I just ended with a hill. Yeah. Um, <laughs> never saw the light of day. One of these days, we'll. Hopefully, Billy, you just have it as an extra feature somewhere. Yeah. Got another question for the yes, sir. Out of the thousands of characters you've played, uh, which ones do you feel more connected to, and like pretty, pretty which ones do you feel more connected to? Who you well, I appreciate you thinking that I played thousands of characters. Um, only hundred. <laughs> I don't know if I played a hundred, but I played a lot of characters. Um, emotionally, I feel Goku is so synonymous with who I am and what I do that I often forget that I play the character. It's kind of like you know. You wake up and I'm Sean, and I feel as comfortable, you know, living in my Sean world as I wake up, put on my pants, whatever, Sean. And it's no different. Other characters are a stretch for me. Um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> Wait, how do I feel about what? Wait, sorry, I go through down on you. What? Like, like your personal, <laughs> your personal feelings towards the character. My personal what? Your personal feelings towards the character. Toward the character, Goku. I have a lot of affinity toward Goku because of what he means to people. And it is not, I've said this over and over, it's not the funnest character to play, only because you have to talk like you're on cocaine all the time, and everything's happy, and then you can scream a lot, and you don't have a lot of emotional depth. I'm jealous of Chris and uh, Eric Vale and uh, Mike McFarlane, who played more fun characters. I don't um, think Mike McFarlane's yeah. character is so incredibly deep. Like, it's not deep, but it's funny. Like, my God, is a master Roshi. Roshi and Yajirobe. <laughs> um, and I find those characters, they're not deeper, but they're definitely funnier. Um, and so for me, Goku is kind of in a separate little emotional space that is very, very personal to me. And very, because my first audition, it, it, it changed my life. Um, so there's a lot emotionally attached to it that's very different than from everything else I played. So, you know, like playing Batman on The Dark Knight Rises, I had to voice match Christian Bale that, uh, for iPad, uh, the cheesy oh. one. Um, so, no, it's a good game. It's a good little game. Um, and, you know, that, that's a big I character that I wanted to play. Other, you did the other day. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know the guy we got to sound like Morgan Freeman. Like he like sounds almost if you get to the Morgan, yeah. he sounds almost exactly like he does. And yeah, he's amazing. Um, and so there's there's a lot of different emotional attachments uh, to different characters depending on what they are. But Goku, I, there's I think the point I'm trying to make is that any emotional attachment I have to Goku, um, the whole rest of my characters I have ever played, I roughly feel the same way. But Goku is completely in a different bubble that's separate from all that, and it's it's very uh, special to me. So. Yeah, it's hard to compare any character I've played to 
Vegeta, really. I, I mean, every other character I've played has been, at most, a few months' worth of work. But Vegeta has been literally 15 years of playing the same guy. And you just can't, you just can't shake that, man. Like, if you, it's just, it's something you, that cannot be compared to. I, it's looking like I may end up doing this voice for the rest of my life. I, <laughs> I joked at Comic-Con that I'm just going to have a grave, and it's gonna, my gravestone's just going to say 9,000 on it. <laughs> <laughs> and the arrow pointed down. <laughs> like, I just got a text from Raditz. He says, Goku makes a sandwich, Fox's ADHD theater? What the What are you talking about? What you asked me to look up? Oh, oh, what did I ask you to look up? <laughs> <laughs> I am so clueless. I'm surprised this guy and that girl even deal with me. I, I I'm amazed. I, I you know even tie my shoes in the morning because uh, I'm so clueless. Uh, I, I'm usually deeply lost in thought. I think we answered the question, right? Or are you done? Sorry. Uh, One Piece podcast. Your Zoom has. Um, uh, Unzoomed it's, Unzoomed, it's now dead. So you're gonna have to get this audio from one of your friends. You're gonna, have to, just to you're gonna have to buy the audio from one of the other news organizations. They're gonna, they're gonna charge you. I'll come to that, man. They try to cock block you. No, you can't have the story. Um, <laughs> so, what are we doing next? Um, and then after that, you okay? And bouncing off of that, um, what roles that you have done do you feel people may not know about, or people don't are underappreciated by people? Because all your bigger roles garner so much more attention. Chrissy, I'm gonna let you answer this one first because you've done a lot more anime. Uh, man, I I've been so lucky. I play a lot of people who are, are really cool, and the people really like a lot of them. Um, and it's not because of me. It's just I, I I have a deep voice that sounds neat on really cool people. Uh, let's see. I wish that more people liked the show Sergeant Frog in America. I played a guy named Giro in Sergeant Frog. Now, I know it's sometimes in a, at anime cons, um, people know who that is, but I just think that show could be far more successful than it is in America. I love playing Giro on that. I think the, the, the episodes are far more international than they than you would think they are. They're all genuinely funny. They have great parody in them. I've heard a lot of great things about that show. God, I it's such a it. funny show. I would watch, like, it's going to be the first show I introduce my daughter to because it's, it, there's nothing. Are there butt bubbles in it? Yeah, they probably are. <laughs> my daughter made up a word for farts. It's called butt bubbles. Um, she's four, right? Yeah, she's four. <laughs> she's had that word for like two years now. Um, <laughs> it's adorable. And uh, yeah, that's definitely something I'd like to see people watch a little bit more. Um, Show that I'm trying to think. We all the other ones I'm thinking of get a fair bit of attention, but that's the one that I'm surprised people don't like more. There are a lot of characters I play that uh, that people aren't aware that I play because I I am trying to change my voice so much. A lot of people still don't know I play King Kai. A lot of people don't know I play Lucario in Mystery of Mew. Um, I played Sh Shokanabo in the like, previous incarnation of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was like a crazy crazy monstery voice. Um, a lot of people didn't know I was playing the Batman thing and, and Dark Knight Rises, uh, and I'm all I don't need I don't I'm happy about that because I, like I said it's 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 when people try to compliment me say I heard you in there I'm like I am not I want you to believe that you know I'm this character um, there's some characters in Yu-Gi-Oh GX that they're not aware of, like Dr. William Crowler and Ojama Yellow and, and Grigor and you know stuff like that that people don't realize I play which is all fine with me. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any in particular voice that I wish. Oh, I was Tetsuki and Giant Robo, which is a really cool, cool anime. Uh, OVA, I think it was the OVA or was the, was the feature film. I don't know. Um, I know and people freak out a lot when I when I've told them that I'm Kuwabara and you Haka show. That's true. So it's a show that they kind of forgot that they even watched all the time. Yeah. Uh, until it's brought up recently. That's true. So those are some. Yeah. Um, and yes, you. Yeah, you've gone through your favorite characters and, and things like that, but in the in the future going forward, is there anything you'd like to do, or even in the past, anything you wish it was you that, that got that part? Uh, I, I mean, for me, now that I'm in LA and I, I'm auditioning for more American cartoons, um, I really want, um, and I did this on, on Kappa Mikey, which was an American cartoon that did okay on Nickelodeon. I thought it was underrated. Um, it's a funny show because it's an anime, the whole show is an anime parody, so it was very funny. Uh, but I've always wanted to have a part that, as a voice I created, that's not a dub, that, like Masuka Nozawa, she creates this voice for Goku, that I would do for a number of years, just like Mel Blanc did Mugs Money, that's kind of 
something, an original voice I create, which I've done on various shows, but nothing that's been crazy popular or very long or very, you know, something like that would be very gratifying, not just financially, <laughs> but more importantly, it would be, you know, you're the guy, you know, like when I was sitting in the room with Frank Welker and he does the Fred voice, I'm like beside myself flipping out and then he busts into Scooby-Doo in like two seconds. You're like, holy crap, I'm 46 and I was like, I don't know, four years old or I don't know how old I was when I first saw Scooby-Doo and I'm flipping out that he's still doing it and uh, sounds just as good as he did back then. So um, uh, something like that career path would be amazing. <laughs> a character like that. What about you? Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a that's a tough question because I I've been I've been fairly lucky. There isn't a lot of original animation in Dallas, so there isn't a whole lot to do on that. Um, I love I love video game work. I like working on anything that's um, like video game related. I did some great work for a company called Twisted Pixel in Austin. It was a game called The Adventures of Captain Smiley. And it was just, I don't know if any of you guys played it with Xbox, XBLA download. I think they had, it was one of the um, one of the titles they released for the early Xbox One as well. Um, that was a really creative character where we didn't have to we didn't have the the video first. We really got to imprint our own characters into into the game. And the first time I ever saw it animated, something I did without seeing the animation first, something that was animated specifically with my voice. It was one of the coolest things. Like I love seeing that, uh, seeing someone else's vision of what your voice impression looks like. Yeah, is <clears throat> such a neat thing to do. So yeah, anything cool. I can do where that's original and animated too would be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, yes. Um, if you could montage your career in one song, in a song. Uh -huh. Well, this you guys are good questions. This is like not. A room full of amateurs. I'd be killing me softly, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm trying to think the of clowns, maybe. <laughs> uh, I, I, gosh, I, that is a, um, a song that represents my career. You can't touch this. <laughs> <laughs> well, my career, uh, you know, You're ice, ice baby. Too <laughs> cold. Is it free? Any suggestions? I don't know. What? Turn down what? Turn down what? Turn down what? Turn down for what? I don't know that song. I don't, I'm not familiar with that song, but that, I bet it's good. Um, <laughs> the Brady Bunch theme song. <laughs> the the Sanford and Son theme song. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what would be. I, I for, at least for as far as Goku is concerned, it's just a, maybe a song that just keeps getting louder and higher and take it to the limit. Yeah, take it to the limit, or you know something like that. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it's definitely metal. It would definitely be metal that just screams louder and louder. Not the Cookie Monster metal. The good, the metal that like is, <laughs> like that kind of metal would be something like I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll probably revisit this question hopefully for the end of the conference in my head and then blurt something out. So hopefully I'll give you a good answer because none of the music I like would be representative of. Man, if I had to pick a song for you, it'd probably be some really weird, complicated Rush song. Oh well, like, that's that's my really band of metal and. So they, oh, the marathon. That, yeah, that would break it. That, actually, that would be it. You mentioned the Rush song. I'm thinking of the lyrics of that song. Yeah, that marathon by Rush would be probably uh, something always fires a light that gets in your eyes. Like, it's all about running a race and being tired and hard and miserable, but you still go, and it gets harder, and you're, if you burn out, you know, you got to hold on until you finish the race. It's all about a marathon. That would probably be representative of my career. Thank you for asking that question. That is such a breath of fresh air from the average questions we get for a room full of fans, as much as I love them. Um, although the best question we got, which is better than all your questions, was the kid at San Diego Comic Con who asked us seven questions. And they said you, have, you can ask one question. question. So he asked us seven questions, and then his final question was, which was this one question, which one of those questions should I ask? <laughs> Seven questions. He goes, I have seven questions. They go, no, you can only answer one. one. Okay, okay. And then he used to ignore us. And yeah. as he's saying them, he's like, when did Goku lose his tail? We're like, episode 49. Like, we're, we're answering them all. We're answering them as he's going along, kind of under our breath. And then he gets to the end, and, and like, everyone's laughing. And he finally goes, which one should which I one ask you? you? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry, but that was the best questions I think we've ever gotten. There was also a dude who was asking about Goku being a bad father. Like, the guy was like, a lot of people think that Goku's a bad father, and I don't think he is a bad father, and I think he was actually really present. What do you think? And so I said, he's a terrible father. He goes, it's okay if your dad loves oh. you. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm sorry. I felt like he was there was something deeper there than why he was <laughs> framing the question that way. So I'm really sorry your dad left you. Yeah. The <laughs> whole audience went. Oh. Uh, yeah, I felt bad for three seconds. Um. <laughs> somebody else was putting their hand. Uh, yes. Um, we seem to have a very interesting situation for this convention. We have the uh, technically a reunion of Yu Yu Hakusho this year with. A good portion of the guests. Kind of. I mean, I had a couple small, small parts of Yu Yu Hakusho. show. Yusuke's sitting right over there. Um, <laughs> and Reddit's. And uh, Lord, Lord Bailey's, Lord Bailey's here. here. And was Travis in that? Travis was in Yeah, it. Travis was in it. Was, what did Travis play? Yeah. yeah. And then Yusuke Urameshi is here. Yusuke Urameshi. I'm sorry, Yusuke. Yusuke. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, question, I know you, Chris, you play uh, Zolo on uh, One Piece. You ever like fall back into another character's voice while you're like, recording a completely different show? Uh, it, it has been complicated lately because Funimation is, has their new broadcast dub initiative where they're bringing all these episodes uh, to the public really quickly. Like if there's only you know a handful of weeks between the time it's aired in Japan and the time they're airing it in America, and because of that, the, the recording booths have been recording like mad, so I'll come in and have nine different sessions in a day, all in completely and vastly different things, and uh, even just two days ago, I was, I had to do a split session where I was Zoro at the beginning of it, and then I had to go do another character in a show called Rage of Bahamut or something like that, where I'm playing this really flamboyant thing. Be like homosexual guy, and, this is, and um, then I have to go back to the Zoro session for a pickup line, <laughs> and they start running it. I'm like, Zo okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Where, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? <laughs> it took a minute to kind of adjust back to where I was supposed to be. Um, but with show, like characters like Zoro, what we played for you know, a billion years, it's not too hard to jump back into that. But it is really hard when you're jumping onto smaller characters. They sometimes have to play references of what it was because I might not even remember what it was. You don't spend enough time in them to feel yeah. to re reference them quickly. I don't know if I need to answer that question. I don't think I do. I, I don't remember the question. You don't. You don't. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. So over the years of working on Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z and you know Dragon Ball Z, uh, Dragon Ball GT, excuse me. How did you guys uh, evolve your voice and evolve the characters? Uh, because they went through different life uh, events and different uh, different events in general that maybe evolved the characters further. Well, part of that is because we're just naturally aging and using our voices <laughs> a lot. The other part of it is that, <clears throat> at least for me, I was very particular about when we started the show, um, I had to imitate either Ian Corlett or Peter, Peter Columbus from Canada because the show was being dubbed in Canada originally. And then when I got cast, I got cast based on the, my ability to mimic that voice uh, pretty accurately. And so I remember when I first got the part, I would ask my producer Barry at the time if I could take home videotapes and watch it over and over. So I really wanted the audience to have a consistent voice. And I remember meeting an old friend of mine. He said, yeah, they placed all the voices on Dragon Ball except Goku. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. And I go, you know, they didn't. They replaced Goku. It's how you know I go because I'm Goku. Um, so I felt pretty val validated that I was getting very close. But uh, as an actor, you know, at some point you have to own the character and kind of make it your own. And if you can listen to early Simpsons, they they're, they're different. And, and uh, uh, at one point during the Super Saiyan transformation, Chris had told me after the fact that they weren't even sure that I could come in and do the kind of screams that were going to be necessary for this. You know, they didn't warn me at all. It's just like it's next day at work, you know. So I get there, and I'm still pretty insecure about owning the character. As you and when, I, when you say own the character as an actor, it means that you're so comfortable with it, you know how you're going to voice it. You're, it doesn't mean that you own it, it's just that's something that you're, you know exactly how to play the character now, and you're not taking influence from anybody but the director at this point, or the animation. And so we did the Super Saiyan transformation, and after that day I went home and I said, I'm done listening to those guys, this is the voice I'm doing, I'm done, period. Now, when we finished Z, 
I was concerned because I knew we were going to go back and throw the beginning, and I was worried that my goat, my goat gets older, he's roughly 40-ish at the end of Z, I think, and I was afraid that when we went back to dub the first 53 episodes, Goku was much younger. Plus, I had to go dub 16-year-old Goku in uh, Dragon Ball. <clears throat> and so we dubbed that after all the Z business. So I had to go back and listen to where I started at episode 53, or whatever it was, and go back and make sure from there I didn't sound as... I sound a little rougher and manly as the character gets older and he's more you know, higher pitched. So I was trying to make sure... So I went back and listened to make sure that there wasn't a weird dovetailing that didn't make sense. I don't know if the rest of the cast did or not, but because I haven't watched it, but uh, that was very important to me. And as far as uh, nowadays, I don't even think that I, I mean, I can hear more texture in my voice just from screaming for so many years, but I don't think it sounds bad. And, and I figure if I'm screaming this many years, if Goku's screaming this many years, you know, well, of course he has sense of me, so I'm not even gonna get to the debate. I <laughs> don't see the age. He doesn't see the age at all, but, um, I think that uh, as far as the vocal changes are concerned, I think they happen naturally with time. And what's weird, Chris will point this out, Vegeta in particular looks really different it than he did. Good. If you compare a picture of him at the beginning of the series to the end of the series, he looks like a completely different person. Like, I joke about the fact that he almost has, he's grown like testicles between his eyes by the end. Like, so <laughs> yeah. it's like these close-ups, and if you look, it's like this, these testicles that are right here. <laughs> He just gets muscles between his, his eyebrows. eyebrows. Like, yeah. uh, and part of the evolution of my voice on that show is that we were really trying to get through that show fast. And, well, and fast for us was really slow compared to now because we were running, we were using archaic equipment. We were recording on tape. Yeah. We had these giant tape recorders that we'd have to use in the session. Every time you do a take, you click and it goes. <laughs> and then it would start sure. to roll and it back and it would up. play. And then it, once you were done with the take, uh, if you didn't, like, I would ask for a lot of wild stuff, which means like, hey, just read the line one more time, read the line one more time, read the line one more time, even not to picture, because as soon as you press stop, for whatever reason, it would just freeze. The whole system would freeze. And sometimes it would freeze for like, 30 seconds, sometimes it would freeze for eight minutes, sometimes it would yeah. freeze for 10 minutes, and if you touched anything, it would just freak out. So you just had to let the system do whatever it was gonna do. And um, I remember, and if you would, if, if you decide to leave the room and you didn't catch it after it would unfreeze, it would start going, oh, you're not working on me anymore? I'll just rewind the tape all the way to the beginning. Yeah. And, and if that happened, that took another five minutes to yeah. pass forward back to where you need to go. <laughs> it um, was very slow. So part of, Part of the evolution of my voice as Vegeta was first uncovering what Vegeta was going through because as we were dubbing this, we were experiencing the series in the same fashion that the characters were. We didn't know, I didn't know where the series was going. We didn't know Vegeta was going to be such a big Yeah, I didn't have access to the American manga. I didn't have, there was no internet back then. We were just, when the episodes would come out or when we get episodes in house, we were like, oh, my character does that. Or Sean's like, yeah. oh, I'm in a, Recuperation tank? I guess I'm poor for yeah. the next month. I call uh, my dad to borrow money. He's like, Dad, my Goku's sick, so I gotta, I gotta borrow some money for gas. He's like, what? And I go, he's in the recuperation tank, so I'm not working, so I have no money. So can I borrow, and he would laugh. He thought it was so funny that I had to borrow money because Goku was sick. <laughs> <laughs> there was a point during the middle of the series where my, my Piccolo and my Vegeta were starting to sound very similar to one another because my voice was just so incredibly damaged from having to do all that screaming for both of those characters. And it was oddly enough, and I wish I, I wish I knew his name or remember, I remember kind of what he looks like, but it was a fan at a convention that I was sitting down drinking a cup of coffee in between something, he came up to me and goes, hey man, no offense at all, but I have noticed that your Regina and Pickle are sounding kind of close to one another. And it really did dawn on me that wow. was the case. So I went back to the studio and I'm like, He's absolutely right. So there was a moment where I kicked Vegeta's voice up a little bit higher and lower Piccolo's voice. But by the end of the series, we were no longer mimicking the uh, Canadians anymore, oh, yeah. and we were just playing them the way we thought they should play. Yeah. But the cool thing is we got to do the whole series, and then we got to do it again. And so we got to experience exactly... Kai, right? Yeah. yeah. Or even some of the overdubs and the redubs and the remasters. Oh, that's true. That's true, so yeah. yeah. We got to experience what they were like, and also we got to do them again and again for the video games. So the more we were doing uh, of these characters, and the more, uh, as we went along, we were getting newer technology that allowed us to be able to reference the Japanese 
uh, and we were never able to do that in the past. No, so, like, we never. Was, I didn't reference the Japanese till my like one of the third video game. I finally heard Masako's voice. Yeah, we didn't even know what the Japanese voices sounded like when we were doing it. I, I heard the Mexican was, Goku before I heard. Oh yeah, the Japanese. Japanese the Goku. only material we had was the uh, was the, the Mexican dub of Dragon Ball. They, that was the closest place that Funimation could get the materials for Dragon Ball Z. So they had to import their the Mexican like production audio equipment, mm -hmm. and we used that equipment to dub it. So a lot of our characters, it's even funny how Majin Buu turned out to sound very similar to the Japanese Majin Buu without us ever hearing it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that's what, it kind of helped Goku sound, I'm sorry, it helped Dragon Ball Z sound very unique. And you know, you know what I think is really cool, and I'm, I'm making a large leap in logic here, you know, as a dub actor, you barely feel like you have the right to, you know, be the character, much less sign autograph or whatever, but Japan has been, Toei has been, particularly with Resurrect, we got their attention big time with Battle of Gods. And they came out and did a subtitle Japanese only premiere in LA, which was huge. Insisted I ride on the limo with Masuka Nozawa, insisted we all go to dinner, insisted, and they were incredibly gracious. And that's unprecedented, I think, in dubbing history to where they would do that for Resurrection F. I mean, it was amazing that they felt like, and we, when we got to dinner, they were like, we had no idea it was this big, and they saw the fans at, uh, at the, the Egyptian theater in LA, and I, through a translator, said, oh, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Like, this is a huge, you know, phenomenon and following. So we feel incredibly validated and gratified that Toye and, you know, cast members and producers and directors are like, hey, we think you're awesome too, go for it. And we've gotten word back that they happen to love our dub. Yeah, the direction the Japanese director loves the American dub of it. Yeah. So, so much so that they really wanted us to be at the premiere. They actually asked us to be there. Yeah, was really that was really, uh, I, that, I don't think that's ever happened in American history ever for a dub. So it's it's kind of unprecedented. In fact, it's, it's unprecedented. Well, what else is unprecedented? And I mentioned this in an interview earlier. Is that uh, Battle of Gods was, to my knowledge, one of the one of the largest, if not the largest, pre-sale theatrical events ever. It had. In for order, anything? For anything. Am I correct in saying this? For the type of event that it was, because it was a limited 40 engagement that broke a bunch of records in that style of gift. I just love how Dragon Ball Z is like, I'm just going to bring it back to Rush, but you have cult Rush fans and you have hidden Rush fans, and then it's just been growing and growing and growing for you know, years and years and years, and now they're having this huge, they don't call it a farewell tour, but it's kind of a farewell tour. And then all these people are coming out of the woodwork, like when Rush went to Brazil, they had 60,000 people at a concert. They didn't have no one they did Russian Rio. Dragon Ball Z is the same way. It's like niche, it's cult. Oh, nobody knows what it is. And now all these Dragon Ball Z fans are being validated. Like, I told you it was awesome. Now it's everywhere. And we feel very validated, vindicated. And it's just all over the place. And we have this you know, great movie release coming out this year in a new series. Everybody, we see it referenced in a, what was it? Did, I don't know, Bree, did you send me something that was a Dragon Ball reference? You see Ronda Rousey doing the, yeah, Rousey. Where Rousey sent Scour at the thing, and Marcus Brimage does the same thing, and you see references, and I, I swear there's a Dragon Ball Z reference in the South Park movie, because they go, Kyle oh, yeah. Palm's a big King Kamehameha bitch, and then he does a thing with his hands. Um, he uh, wore the over 9,000 shirt at WrestleMania 31. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's a, it, it is officially a pop culture phenomenon, and I, I don't think it has shows any signs of stopping. Um, so we're, we're just shocked and thrilled to be a part of it. It's so funny because I was so Goku like when I got the part, I thought when I got on the show and it was number one Cartoon Network, it was going to be like it is now back then, but it wasn't. So I was like, okay, it's going to be great. And I was real excited that it wasn't. I was like, but we're number one Cartoon Network, but it wasn't. And I'm like, come on, it's a great show, but it wasn't. And then 15, 16 years later, I'm like, I was right. <laughs> you know, so I'm very happy about that. It's been a great ride. Uh, and, and I expect to be, you know, Moscow's 72, I think, now, and she started in her 40s voicing Goku, so I'm like, wow, okay, if I do Dragon Ball Super, if they do a jillion episodes, I'm going to be well into my 50s before uh, I'm yeah. done doing this. <laughs> I'm going to be, like, deep into my 30s by the time I'm done working. <laughs> <laughs> um, has working in anime fulfilled any of your bucket list goals? Well, yeah. Like I said, working with Frank Welker, which is an anime, that's a bucket list one. There was another bucket list moment. Um, there's a few bucket lists, and I don't really actually have a bucket list, uh, other than a bucket list of you know collecting various buckets. Um, yeah, but <laughs> working at anime created the bucket. For yeah, us. Like it's it made everything possible for us. And we've been uh, we actually turn down trips sometimes to the most amazing places because we're too busy doing things. 
Well, we've been to Australia, uh, New Zealand, Japan, the UK, uh, all over the world. And we didn't have to pay for any of it. I know. That was the cool <laughs> part. <laughs> And I would have my girlfriend, uh, who I'm hopefully married this year or next year. We're working that out. But, you know. And I um, wouldn't have dated her before Sean met her. Yeah. He's here. Dragon Ball Z. But, like, the people in our lives, the friendship Chris and I have, like, it's just like a crazy. And, and, and I like to think about terms of cause and effect. Like, you got this little Japanese guy named, I don't know what little he is, but I just. He's pretty he's tiny. Yeah. He's, Kira, he's just sitting in his room, using his imagination, drawing, you know, in the 80s or 70s or whatever. And then. You know, he's never met me, he doesn't know, maybe knows who I am now, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter. I guess. Uh, no, no, he does not. He doesn't even know me, but it doesn't matter because that little guy, w w the imagination of a pen and a story, you know, the pen being mightier than the sword, is like this massive explosion having not just an effect on fans who are inspired to do better or whatever, but us, on us personally as, as cast members of the show. And Chris and I are just, you know, two of the cast members. I think most, if not all the cast feel the same way. That this, you know, this is just a dub that would radically transform our lives in a way that we could never possibly imagine. Um, I remember when I was very depressed before I got on Dragon Ball, and I'm not, a, I'm not any type of religious person really, but I just put a message out to the universe that I just wanted something to make my life great, and if I would, if I, if I got it, I'd treat it like gold. And uh, right after that, I got on Dragon Ball, and I was like, that's it, and I'm gonna grab on that, hang on to it, and that's what I'm gonna do, and I'm gonna just go balls to the wall, non-stop, all the way, the whole time, no matter how tired I am. Do you know, it's really funny you mentioned that premonition thing. What? That, like, that, that you... Oh, I put it out there, yeah. Because I, I didn't necessarily, but I had... Well, you're really weird, lucky. <laughs> but, but I had this really weird premonition. Like, at the before I got the job on Dragon Ball, it's funny you mentioned that, it just reminded me, before I got the job on Dragon Ball, I was dating this girl, and I was in college, and she really wanted me to move with her, she was going to study opera in Chicago, and she said, "You should move there with me and go." I'm like, "I can't do it. I can't go." She said, "Why can't you go?" I was like, "I feel like I've got to stay here for some reason. I feel like I I can't leave." And it might have been because I just didn't like her, but <laughs> <laughs> but it, there was something that made me not want to go. I'm like I just like I feel like something's going to happen, and I really need to stay here for it. And it was not the six months later that I got the offer to work on. My, my 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 thing was roughly the same time period before that, and the only thing that's similar to me, and this and this is after I got on Dragon Ball, I stayed in New York. I was living in New York for ten years, uh, working on very poor kids and working on various jobs, and I had always had this quest that I didn't feel like my career could go anywhere real until I had the right partner. That was just real important to me, and I had a And work. then you met me. And then I met Chris, and now we're no. We're really excited about the Supreme Court decision. Sexually. Uh, sexually. But, but then I, and I stayed in the New York area, with, and my income was going terribly because the, the industry was drying up up there, and I was living in a shit apartment, and, and I worked on a lot of stuff, but everything was drying up, and I just felt like I needed to stay for some reason, and I met Bree, um, and then I was like, okay, I got now I can go do what I need to do. And, and it's a very similar story that I was waiting for the right person while I was in New York, and I was towards the end of my, of my time here. It was getting really rough for me. Like, it was good for a while, but once everything started tanking in 2008 with the economy, four kids started tanking because they were having financial trouble um, for a number of reasons. And uh, I was working on you know, doing 36 different voices and six different shows down to one voice on one show. And I would worked at every animation studio in Manhattan practically, and I was not getting work even though I was good because nobody was making any new animation. Um, and so I waited and waited, and then and I didn't have a demo the whole time, I didn't have an agent the whole time. And then after doing all that work, when I met Debbie Derryberry, who's the voice of Jimmy Neutron, she was like, "Why don't you come to LA and you know join the union, get a, you know get, make some real money?" And because I waited, I had all this material to choose from to make my demos, and then I cut my demo together, sitting in an apartment in Philly with Bree, and then I just went to LA, and I've been there for two years, and it's been very successful for me out there so far. So there's a lot of definitely a lot of mystical things that go on. My producer just sent me another funny image. What is it? Oh yeah, okay. So he sent, okay, sorry. I thought this was related to the panel. We'll talk. Um, sorry, that was, that's why I looked at my phone. But yeah, that's kind of, there's a lot of mystical, like, and Chris and I's friendship, it's weird, because I'm more like Vegeta in our friendship, and he's more like, he's very happy-go-lucky, and I'm pretty grumpy. Um, and he's very tolerant of me, and, and the kind of battles and stuff, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of art paralleling life, at least in our lives and in my personal life. I feel like I'm more Piccolo than I am Goku. Like I'm, oh, yeah, I'm just picked that as a more relaxed life. and I can hear everything. Yes, that's true. It's more relaxed, you hear everything. But he's less grumpy than Piccolo. Like, Piccolo can be kind of grumpy. Um, he's more goku in terms of his playfulness, you know? And I can be that playful, but when I get pissed off, I just forget it. And I, I, I hate that about myself, and I like admitting it because I feel like it's the only way I can change. So, um, 
uh, but our relationship has had very similar. I feel like you know what I think about. It, I feel like like you've been constantly trying to get me to be good. Like Goku has been trying to get Vegeta to be good this whole time. Like I'm just going to give you shit until you're good. That is true. You know, and and, and it, it's a beautiful and annoying thing, but I love him for it. And <laughs> and it is. And I I step back from it and realize it. But in the moment, I'm all pissed off. You know. Um, yeah, Sean has a tendency to get really angry about stuff that, in my opinion, is not that something you right. should get angry about. And instead of like making it easier for him, I sometimes like to kind of just poke at it a yeah. little bit just to see what would happen. And, and then I go super saiyan. It's like, oh, yeah, no, I, I do. I, I, I have this terrible temper. Um, and uh, Sexually. Sexually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, watch Resurrection Net. Thank you. No, um, <laughs> like that's our talking point, and we totally skip, which I don't care. It's fine because you guys have great questions, and it all matters, you know, to the Dragon Ball universe. So we're happy. Um, any, I think we're wrapping. Yes, we're gonna wrap. Um, this has been great. We've never done a press conference before, and we're so appreciative. I think that there are so many news organizations that were interested in talking with us. So thank you. Thank you very much. And you guys did not have crappy questions. So trust me, after six, I, Chris is really tired, but like I walked in an interview once, I go, these questions are not suck, or I'm walking out of here. I like the last thing, because I'm so tired of really inane questions. You might have asked one of the most deep questions I've ever heard um, in terms of mixing music with it. So these questions have all been really spectacular, and it's a very... You come to the panel, ask the same question. Ask the same question, and interrupt the guys asking stupid questions. Uh, thank you so much, you guys are great, thank you. This has been the One Piece Podcast episode 378 for the week of July 27th, 2015. Uh, dude, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, thanks, Zach. You know, it was it was a, a really hard time uh, getting here. And, you know, we, we literally spent so many hours doing this. But, uh, you know, we finally we finally managed to accomplish our goal and record this episode. Yes, uh, this episode has been recorded. Uh, and I want to give a big thanks to uh, Christopher Sabbath for sitting down with us and for uh, Stephen Paul for sitting down with us for uh, that segment as well. Uh, so I, I really think that's it. I just want to remind people to listen to the read-through this Thursday going over Sabodi, Amazon Lily, and Impel Down. You could also pronounce it Shabandi or Sabandi. Uh, <laughs> there's no correct way to say it, so I'm going to just say it the incorrect way. Uh, please also check out the One Piece Connection. That's at onepiecepodcast.com. Uh, and please go there for uh, a lot of news and editorials that we'll be putting out this week, um, including the uh, release date of Volume 79, which I'll say is in October if you want the actual date check the website uh, and I'm not giving you the actual date because I forgot it off the top of my head uh, there's also some weird silhouettes I don't know what's up with that uh, check back on the site on August 3rd maybe we'll have an answer to that um, and I think this past week was also the 18th birthday for One Piece which is a big deal um, so happy birthday One Piece I think that's, that's all there is and you smell that. like one too that is, that is accurate um, and if you like Christopher Sabat's voice, you could hear him on One Piece Season 7 Voyage 2, which is available for pre-order coming September 1st, and Season 7 Voyage 3 is coming, um, that's the Impel Down arc, and that is coming October 27th. We highly recommend you pick up that set. Uh, I think that's everything. Dude, how could the good people find you? Uh, find me or find the One Piece podcast? Well, first you, and then you could tell us. The... Oh, wonderful. Well, they can find me, of course, on Twitter at Dude Exclamation and also on Tumblr at Dude Exclamation. Uh, I will be opening up commissions again pretty soon, so keep an eye out for that if you really care. And uh, you can also occasionally see me doing Super Art Fight. Uh, we've got a show coming up in September in Richmond, Virginia, and we've got another show coming up in October at the Auto Bar in Baltimore. Also, if you've ever wanted to try Super Art Fight and live in the D.C., Maryland area, uh, now's your chance. Uh, Super Art Fight Idol is happening currently. Uh, well, it will be happening, rather. Um, check out superartfight.com for details. Uh, if you ever thought that it'd be fun to get up there and use your quick wits and draw stuff in front of people while also wearing a crazy costume, then it is for you. 
Um, anyway, back to you, Zach. Um, yeah, one more thing. I since we're doing promotions, uh, I just one more thing about the One Piece connection, and then I will stop talking about it. Uh, and that is that we've had frequently asked questions. Hey, can we have an audio version of it? Um, I do plan on putting something together. I recorded something actually with Brian and Cy, uh, which has some audio issues that I'm trying to resolve. If that can't be resolved, uh, we'll record something new. Um, I would do an audio book version, you know, like reading through it, except I don't think my voice is a good voice for that. So I will figure out a good substitute for my voice uh, for someone who actually wants to read through that whole thing. Um, and I will let you know if that happens. Uh, you guys will know as soon as I know. Um, but that's it. So, dude, how could the good people contact us? Well, Zach, they can contact us on Facebook.com slash One Piece Podcast, Twitter.com uh, at One Piece Podcast. We have a Tumblr, also One Piece Podcast. Uh, of course, OnePiecePodcast.com. And uh, also on Stitcher and SoundCloud. Um, and, of course, rate and review on iTunes. Uh, that helps us out a lot. And they can also call our phone number, Zach. They could call our phone number is 347-497-MAJI. MAJI. They could call our phone number again at 347-497-6254. Call anytime. Call anytime. With your questions, comments, and theories. You forgot one, and that is YouTube, but that's a good thing because I want to mention YouTube. You could go to YouTube.com slash One Piece Podcast, and a huge thanks to Cody, uh who every week has been putting these episodes up uh, a week after they air, plus all the read-throughs. He's been working really hard there, so please go to YouTube. Let, if your friends are afraid of downloading or listening to us on SoundCloud, that is the place to go. Uh, you can check out all of our stuff there. We'll also be putting out OPP Dallas there, which Jose will have time to do when he finishes IGPX next month. Uh, and then he's going to – and he also has someone else helping him out with uh, OPP Dallas. So it's it's begun. The work has begun. But uh, it probably won't finish for another few months. Uh, we're hoping to have it out starting in late August, September. Um, and I am going to bother the hell out of uh, Jose to make sure that happens. Uh, I – also, just uh, so we could thank them properly, Jose and Ed, you could follow Jose at Jose underscore CNN. Please pick up IGPX coming out tentatively in November from Discotech. He put a ton of hard work in that. I will be picking that up. I have not seen the show yet, and that's sad for me because I'm a crazy Toonami fan, and I should. So I'm going to watch that uh, because I know how much work he put into that. And, and it's a, and Mark Hamill's on that set, and... Uh, and uh, Jason DeMarco and so on and so forth. So it's 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 worth it. Um, and Ed is on Twitter at Edward E. Fastizio. I think he posts there a couple times a year. Uh, so follow him there. Um, I think that's everything. So, dude, thank you so much for coming on again. My pleasure. Uh, my name is Zach. And my name is Dude. We'll see you next week, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.